You have tuned in for a sleep podcast I'm here to seek the truth Live from Scotland around the UK The one and only sleep podcast Enjoy the show Can I ask important questions? No matter how bizarre The truth might be Tune in for Slick Podcast, keeping it real, keeping it groovy. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, or a good day to you, when and wherever you're listening from, and a very warm welcome to the show. I'm your host, Simon Laurie King, and this is The Slick Podcast. Coming up on today's show, I'm joined by author, broadcaster, independent researcher and all-round good guy, Jared Murphy, to talk about his excellent book, It's Not Aliens, Worse, It's Us, Discovering Our Lost History. This book is a culmination of Jared's findings and conclusions through his rigorous investigations all over the world into our ancient past. Before I welcome Jared to the show, let me set the scene for you. Have you ever wondered who built the pyramids? Stonehenge or Satsuaman in Peru, whose stones weigh up to 200 tons. Does anybody still believe that the people, which I would call living on the cusp of known history or the prehistoric, dressed in animal furs and carrying a club, were responsible for such impossible architectural achievements? I certainly don't. Architecture involving the quarrying, transport and cutting of stones so immense it would be impossible for our current level of technology to lift it or move it, let alone achieve its perfection in their placement. This book is amazing in its unique revelations about our possible origins deep into the antiquity of the unknown past, but more importantly, it clearly substantiates them with no doubts and further has over 200 amazing photos to back up these facts and findings. The company line that we have been taught that modern human beings, that is to say anatomically the same as us, have only been around for only three to four hundred thousand years, quite frankly it's becoming laughable. From engineered soil found in vast quantities all over the planet that cannot be reproduced today, to the strange stone spheres that are found all around the world, that it's claimed can balance or completely cancel out seismic disturbances. Did aliens intervene with our past selves and leave us the impossible architectural anomalies found around the globe today? Or did an ancient, unknown society build and create these themselves? Did a technologically advanced superior human civilization once exist on our planet that we know nothing about today, or rather being told nothing of? And if they did, when was that and what happened to them? For example, how is it that the land mass of Antarctica is shown to be depicted accurately upon some ancient maps from hundreds of years ago. Remember that these maps were made long before we were able to discern the correct topography of that landmass, which is still underneath vast ice sheets today. It was only comparatively in recent times with satellite imagery that were able to determine that in fact, these ancient maps are credible and therefore completely unexplainable. As far as scientists tell us, the ice sheets that cover that continent have been in place for thousands of years at least. Jarrah's book also brings the light to light the science of essential body movement as well as incredible beneficial breathing techniques once known to the ancients and handed down through time in religious practices to only a very select few. The science of eating correctly and bringing our own abilities that are dormant in most of us back to a superhuman level. My guest today I have no doubt will answer the questions I have and I'm sure will captivate us all with those answers. So without further delay, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Jared Murphy to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I'm really excited. Um, I'm, I'm waiting for, I'm at the starting line and I'm ready to go. But before we get into anything, Jared, um, please tell us a little bit about yourself and what made you start looking for a lost civilization? Or the evidence of a lost civilization? Yeah, sure. Uh, Well, the book, It's Not Aliens Worse, It's Us Discovering Our Lost History, came about from me deciding I was going to write fiction specifically about, well, it's been over four years now. 
I spent six months with my editor and publisher, Olaf Phillips, uh, revising actually over, I ended up writing another 60,000 words. And, <laughs> and after what started out to be just a research into what was going to be reanimating the oldest mummies any government could find on earth was the plot of my book originally. And mm -hmm. that really isn't the driver. I guess the heart of the question is what got me going was probably being five or six years old and deciding that I thought Star Wars and Indiana Jones was the coolest thing ever. And I either wanted to be an archeologist or write books and make movies. And so history, its content, uh, across the board, I was fascinated with from, unfortunately, a very, I'm outing myself as a total nerd from the time I was young. And mm -hmm. I just had a fascination in the subject, which started to delve into uh, quantum mechanics and quantum philosophy, the whole idea of, you know, if a tree falls in a forest, does anybody hear it? And I started reading, well, what what is the scientific basis for that? And I had a very big interest in genetic technologies, and I played the violin seriously till I was 21. And I thought, okay, what, you know, going to write this fictional story. I had done some writing prior, and all I was looking for were the oldest mummies on Earth, which were the elongated skulled uh, mummies of the Paracas of Peru. And they have really big, weird, alien-looking heads. And I thought, okay, well, they are naturally preserved in Peru to at least 9,000 years old. I thought that'd be interesting. And the very next day of research, I end up hearing about this thing called Terra Preta, which is an engineered soil, which means that someone made it. And it has a lot of very interesting properties. And that was day two where I'm watching a documentary thinking I'm going to learn something about the Paracas maybe. And it was all about this Colonel Percy Fawcett that got lost in, uh, of course, Brad Pitt played him about seven eight years ago in the lost city of z where oh, colonel percy yeah. fawcett from yeah and he gets lost and on the uh, in this documentary there's an archaeologist that takes this guy to about it's about 12 it's about th two and a half meters three meters tall of black dirt that has pottery shards in it that has a number of different uh just pieces of stuff that is clearly man-made and this is a really tall, what I thought at first was a mound, and it wasn't a mound. It was just they had excavated into the shoreline, not far into uh, the Amazon jungle at all, like pretty much right from a shoreline of the river. And they said, yeah, this is called Terra Preta. It's an engineered soil. Soil scientists have looked at it for 100 years. Nobody knows what it is. Uh, exactly. It's the richest growing soil on earth. It can filter carbon dioxide, heavy metals. It's really neat, but let's go look for Colonel Percy Fawcett. The last city he was in was right up, right up, right up the road here. So we're just going to go to that village. And I, and I'm like, Oh wait, what, what engineered soil? Yeah. And, and that, that was just almost dismissed. So can you tell me a little, yeah. <laughs> so can you tell me a little about this engineered soil? Um, I mean, I've read a little bit about it in your, your excellent book that we can't make it. So we can't make it. We have satellites. We have telecommunications. You and I are speaking across the pond thousands of miles away. And you're telling me we cannot make I mean, it not just a case of putting some manure here and some some lime there. Why can't we make this? What's so special? about Yeah, it? that's what's yeah. Yeah, that's what's so weird is that we're mimicking it. So what they've done is modern forms of it are called biochar. So it's a so if you and I were going to have an apple orchard and we were going to grow apples, you can buy a particular biochar that's engineered and it mimics the ideas and personalities of what they've learned from this soil in that it you know, if you're going to grow wheat or corn or or an apple orchard, you would have a particular biochar that would tweak some nutrients for the plants you're growing. The problem is, despite having electron microscopes and the ability to analyze this biochar, they still the, of Terra Preta, they still can't sort out why is it that it's almost self-sustaining. It's it's up to thousands of years old. They don't even have an end date. There there is um, the last uh, scientific uh, just eight. So this is a this is a problem. And let me tell you why. It's a problem because you can't have Terra Preta, not only in Brazil, to the tune of twice 
the area they say of basically the United Kingdom or Spain. That that's what they're guessing. They're 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 guessing at this. That and this they're, is the and, and, you know, soil. This is the engineered soil. Yeah, just just in Brazil, and and they're only saying that wow. because you know at standard academia doesn't put their neck out on the line very far. So if they're giving us a number of well, it's probably twice the area of uh, of the UK or 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 Spain, but also I identical to this exact recipe in Northern Africa and in Australia is the same terra preta. Now, here's the problem with the whole subject. Terra preta is just Portuguese for black earth, black soil. It's it's there, it's what they call it, but the identical recipe, so it'd be exact, it'd be like McDonald's or pick Cadbury as a brand. Mm-hmm. And on three continents that are not supposed to be talking, at least seven or eight thousand years ago, we have a soil that is made by man. It is not a bunch of manure and compost and an accidental forest fire mixed with some dead dinosaurs that made this soil. This soil has very specific properties. It's piezoelectric. So think not only can it hold an electrical current, but you could send something through it, just like uh, information in a bloodstream. Uh, You could, or well, think, think Morse code. You could, any kind of wave, any electromagnetic signal you want to send through the soil, depending on how you're doing it, you could do it. But it also filters heavy metals and carbon dioxide. And terra preta is not the only engineered soil. So not as cool as finding a mummy, not as sexy as a golden monkey idol at the you know <laughs> Indiana Jones temple. But here we are with a soil that's not just terra preta. In Ukraine, there is a black market for the soil coming out of Ukraine. And in in Siberia, all the way through the Ukraine into mainland uh, Western Europe, all the way to North America, Central America, there are other engineered soils. One of them is called Chernozems. And the, the deal is, uh, yes, modern soil scientists have said, oh, well, there's some qualities here that make sense. So they've taken the concept, the personality of it, and they've recreated it. But here's the deal. The old terra preta seems to maintain itself. It seems to manage to not end up getting um, uh, ruined, really, over a period of time. It tends to keep holding its value and properties without what well, well right now with complete neglect and without use. So there's two problems then with this whole big elephant in the room. One is you can't have engineered soil all over the world where it's supposed to be nomadic, uh, Neolithic, Paleolithic, just paleo, just loincloth, rock banging, hunter gatherers, right. wolf on the head, you know, star chasing, just simple people. You're not supposed to have farmers and settlers. And like Gobekli Tepe, we find this site, but there's at least six tepes in Turkey. And they've been at least to some degree in the last 45 years, 46 years, Klaus Schmidt, the one who the German archaeologist that worked on Gobekli Tepe passed away Mm -hmm. now almost two years ago. But here we are with some sites that were literally not supposed to exist. Well, it's not sexy and interesting when there's no statues, no writings, no nothing. But if we just staked out around the entire world for people to get their heads around this, think of all the deserts we have now that just look so oddly placed. I mean, we could go down that rabbit hole, but right now there is engineered soil all over the earth that either means one of two things. Not only have we grossly underestimated ancient populations, which is what the LIDAR scans from Guatemala are showing that Mm -hmm. just came out through even National Geographic just in 2017, uh, almost 2018 now. But we're talking about a worldwide population that wasn't just creating growing soil. This soil filtered carbon dioxide. So all those issues about emissions, everyone has to realize that with 8 billion people on the planet, that if you gave them all at least in American terms, if you gave them all of an acre and you put them all basically, and this is, I have to credit Michael Tellinger with the analogy, but basically they could live in two South Africa's. You could take all the people in the world and give them an acre and we would occupy about two South Africa's. That's not a very big population, but what kind of population 
and what kind of industry would be required to have engineered soil that filters carbon dioxide, heavy metals, fertilizers, and is a really good growing soil if an ancient advanced society was even using it for growing, for food, in quotes, then you would have exactly what we're finding. The identical recipe of terra preta is in Northern Africa and Australia. How do you explain that one? If those three continents were not communicating, it's impossible. So right there, we have holes, right? I, I was just going to say that this does not sound like hunter-gatherers. This does not sound like people carrying clubs. This does not sound like simpletons that couldn't understand, let's say, a match. So it's almost like you're suggesting this is an intelligent soil. I'm not even going to go as far as saying um, like na uh, nanotechnology, but it must be on some yeah. level. What you're suggesting is further, much further than we ourselves can do. Sorry, I had just had to get there and carry on, Jared, please. Well, I think that's a good, that's actually a good benchmark and a good description of what people need to understand about what we're describing at first it sounds boring it sounds yeah but where's the mummies where's the temples where's the pyramids that this is the problem right. this is a society that isn't just doing exactly what you said they're not just grabbing um a clay and a sand and a particular oh well you know if you grow this soil with this particular compost it comes up with this particular fungus or bacteria and eventually you get you, you get terra preta. That's not, this is not that. This is not an alchemy. This isn't just a case of the right number of bat wings and puppy dog tails and voila, on Friday the 13th and on a summer solstice, you have this <laughs> terra preta, which is how a lot of ancient sciences get explained away because they think there's an alchemy to it. There is, there, but there is a science to this and it is very advanced. And there's another thing, a very young, young, uh, almost unbelievable archaeology right now is nanoarchaeology. I'm calling it that because, yeah, people right now, it never occurred. I can't tell you how many vases have been recovered in Europe that were never tested for their residues, that were never controlled in their... Um, uh, right now, it, I remember 15, 18 years ago when they started talking about, well, you know, these bodies, these burials, it's like we pull out the bones. But if we would stop, drop and think for a second, they figured out that, well, all the chemicals and the residue left within the body has either. I, I hate the graphic here for everyone, but uh, don't 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 eat your food right now while you're listening, but melt it away <laughs> from the bone and it's in the soil beneath or around or in the container or sarcophagi of whomever you are excavating, the reality is that they started realizing that the soil itself around the body has information. So from a chemical analysis standpoint, whether it's a vase or an altar that was supposed to be used for uh, bloodletting of some kind or sacrifice, or whether it's a, a body, they are starting to be more appreciative of the genetic, not just, well, there's genetic testing that can be done uh, for who these people are, like the Paracas in Peru, which has almost been done nowhere. So shame on every university and anyone who's an archaeobiologist of any kind. But Can I ask you about that? Oh, yeah. Can I ask you about Because um, I obviously having um, listened to you a lot, and I would recommend everybody to go onto your site, Not Aliens, uh, and subscribe. Um, amazing pictures. Um, but the, the, the Paracas... Um, in my way of uh, what I looked before I was actually on your site and started listening to you, they were definitely alien skulls. But that is not the case. They are, in fact, human. There is no doubt they are human. So could you tell us about that, just to clear that up? And it, it's not a case of squashing a infant's head between boards, um, wrapping. They are actually, or were, a, is it the right way to say, a breed of yeah, human? Absolutely. You're right. Completely right. They're, these are people who, and for those who haven't seen it, like you said, they can internet search it, the Paracas of Peru or Nazca Paracas Peru, because uh, you're going to come up with the Nazca lines, which, so there's this, we have this giant board game of adult version of Clue, which I don't know if Clue, was Clue popular in, in, in England and Scotland? Um, no idea. No okay, idea. So, so the game was, you all start out in different corners and you're in a giant manor. It's a board game where you're going to guess the murder weapon, the uh, suspect, 
and uh, the room that a murder took place in, and it's called Clue. And you just oh, I think I think they called it Clue. Do. They put a doe on it. I think it's called Cluedo. I think that's what I, I had. A, I had a sheltered uh, upbringing, but I think they called that. Cluedo, like who killed the person with a candlestick, that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, Colonel Mustard with the candlestick right. in the library. Yeah. So we're, we're really doing an adult, we're doing a total adult sci-fi version of this because it's the engineered soil on top of nano, what, what ultimately, by the way, side note before we start on this next point is <clears throat> seismic meta structures. It sounds like a big thing, but what we're actually going to talk about later, which is a huge exciting area of archaeology that I'm hoping to push further and get to some sites and do some testing, is that it's not just that the soil was for growing, uh, piezoelectric for communications and for gosh knows what else in reference to maybe stimulating growth of particular fungus and bacteria and using them as a much more integrated biological network. But we're talking about Seismic metastructures are materials as small as uh, a nanoparticle to as large as a boulder or a stone sphere placed. And depending on its complexities, like a stone sphere could be hollow with multiple different layers and used under not only individual buildings, but whole cityscapes to mute them from earthquakes. And that's all a modern study called seismic metastructures. And we can mm-hmm. get to that because nanoarchaeology is chemistry, the chemistry of finding, you know, melted bits and gooey bits of whatever's left of something that's, you know, happened within the last few thousand years, 10,000 years, 20,000. And there's even been, and this is uh, perplexing a number of scientists, as a side note, there have been soft tissues of Tyrannosaurus rex and uh, triceratops. And I believe there's been some other dinosaurs where they, and we're not talking in amber here, we're talking, they've found soft tissue and there's no explanation for that. But that's, that's just that. Uh, my only point right now is that it's either, it's very complex when it comes to doing bio, ancient bio, biological testing of whether it's DNA or a small structure. Mostly what was being done in archaeology was to go find a cool statue to put on your mantle at your villa. And that that was archaeology. It wasn't meant to save anyone's history. They were just trying to find pretty things. So things like soil, things uh, like foundational material, uh, the the true science, uh, despite some of it surviving, got lost. And so the practice, this perspective, this paradigm that we created about, well, this is as advanced as everyone was uh, in Egypt. They had copper tools and they and the Aztecs, well, they told the conquistadors that, well, the gods built this, but, well, we know they built it, even though, again, you're looking at constructions that are cymatic, polygonal, earthquake-stopping, piezoelectric buildings that don't have their tops on anymore. They have river rock topping them off, and then you have a drawing from a university or from a paleoanthropologist, someone looking at the social culture, finishing off the roof of a cymatic polygonal construction with a thatched roof, which drives me nuts. And then can I ask you, have you the bracket. can I, sorry, can I ask you um, just to explain uh, what exactly polygonal construction is and maybe the advantages of using that? Yeah. So there's these giant blocks, whether it's uh, South, so South America, good examples are Saxe Waman, Ollante Tambo, Tiwanaku, Pumapunku. These are all famous sites now that uh, Machu Picchu is pretty super obvious now, but it's uh, Egypt, Angkor Wat, Easter Island, uh, Central America, uh, uh, even, um, well, Siberia, and they range from 3,000 Baalbek, Lebanon, they, uh, the Temple of Delphi, all over Greece, Malta, you name it. Basically, we can endlessly go on that there is a worldwide culture that was able to, with some instrumentation, which will, co- will, which will bring us back to the unanswered question of the Paracas, which were not smushed heads people. But what I think mm-hmm. happened was uh, you have a society that had instrumentation that was able to say, well, at this depth of the Earth's crust and at this location, there could be an earthquake. And that earthquake is going to rattle where we're going to build this particular building or this complex or this coliseum or this uh, entertainment house or this living, what fill in the blank. So they built, uh, whether they were 
I, okay, whether they're a ton, whether they're 500 pounds, or whether they're literally 3,000 tons or 1,000 tons, th- these are blocks that are not just big and square. They could be 15, 20, 30 sided, and they could be uh, a couple meters, three meters, four meters, uh, uh, 17 meters long by fill in the blank, just cyclopean in nature. And yet they fit together on every side. You can't put a piece of paper between them. Uh, the description of these blocks is as if they were melted, like they were like kind of hot, fluffy marshmallows that had multiple sides because they fit together so well. Nobody can figure out how they uh, scraped. You have to think about as a mason, when you try to put a side together, that's maybe one surface side of one of these blocks is a meter and a half by three or four meters long, but that's just one side and it's pitched. So it's not even square and straight. It's almost like a wedge shape and it's on a piece that's going to have maybe six more cuts sides, but that entire length and width fits along another surface perfectly. So you have to be able to test that. You have to know that those two pieces fit together. And all over the earth, this construction is very similar. These are very well-hewn blocks. They are quartzites, they are granites, they are the they are the hardest rocks on earth. They are high crystalline content. So if you were gonna be a wave and frequency society that was also engineering soil. So in our big game of adult clue, uh, engineered soil goes along well with not only growing things, but for a high, and this is the hint that uh, we're going to get back to those paracas to answer your question about their elongated skulls. But we're talking about a worldwide society that occupied vast amounts of land beyond where we are at currently, pre- at least the last younger Dryas, and I suspect that the last uh, epoch was, I have reasons to believe that it's probably at least the prior flooding of over 50,000 years ago was the last time they were worldwide and 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 on, on the surface of the planet in, in mass. But the Paracas represent a group of humans that uh, were part of this polygonal society and what we know about them is they look very alien because of their giant skulls, but they only have one suture line. So the human skull has three. Well, the way it looks from a distance, it looks like there's a cross on your skull, but the practice don't. They only have one and their necks don't enter their skulls the same way that ours do. And the four magnum, which are um, arterial dissections, well, they're arterial uh, entry and exit points for the skull. They are in completely different locations. I've I was able to show this to a couple doctors and a couple surgical nurses. Actually, both the doctors I talked to were surgeons. And uh, but the point is, in looking at the human anatomy, just like Brian Forrester brought it up, that these are not anatomies of uh, of what we consider or what we know of to be human. And this ties into this bigger picture of what we're talking about because it's that. The society that we're dealing with, our assumption about our where we were 50,000 or 40,000 or 20,000 or 10,000 or 6,000 years ago, we have this paradigm that we go off of. So we don't have a complete paleoanthropological record. We do not have a complete picture of every bone or tissue in order. Again, we're talking about the difference between theories of evolution, theories of out of Africa, theories, Western theories of history versus the facts. And so what we have here, like Neanderthal and Denisovan, here we have a mystery. We know right now, it's been chatted about even more lately, that there's this, oh, we have a 12 to 14% marker inside the human body that represents another race of humans, but we don't know who they are. I'm not saying they're the Paracas. But what I am saying is that without digging very hard or trying to find Australopithecus or uh, some theoretical uh, morphological, you know, just morphology, just looking at a bone and you can get really darn good at that. I'm not saying you can't, but you have the Paracas in Peru based on some recent genetic testing a year ago that says that they're probably from Crimea, that they're from Eurasia. There's also elongated skulls found all over the world. They're found 
they've been found in uh, Central Europe. They've been found in Egypt. They've been found. You can see a lot of the Egyptian busts show larger, either bulbous. There's different styles, like the Star Child, which is not a deformation. This is again another another skull that was found in a cave in South America. But the the Paracas have uh, a significant amount of mummification where there is soft tissue. I was able to uh, meet with Nassim Harriman and he was able to tell me about how he harvested soft ocular nerve and brain tissue that was still fresh off of a 3000 year old mummy. And that to me is significant because it also says something about the programming of gen- genetics itself. But you have these people in Peru that have these giant skulls. They were known for textiles. And I think that's post some massive flood catastrophe, the Paracas around all the giant pyramids and structures and whatever they were around. And again, the mummies are dating to 9,000 years and maybe plus or minus a little older. So we're getting really close to this period that, according to the Younger Drives, that there is this massive biblical flood-like catastrophe somewhere between 11,600 years ago and 12,600. So it, it frequently just gets uh, in dialogue, just for sake of conversation, 13 to 11 plus thousand years ago, there was a massive worldwide uh, simultaneous event that caused uh, displacement, not only of water, but of people, a lot of catastrophe. But the Paracas, uh, getting really close to that event in Peru, the question is, were they there before the Younger Dryas or were they there after? But here's there's two points to this, is that they look alien, but they're not. They're human. They're born that way. Their heads aren't smashed because the suture lines are different. The forum magnum, the, 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 the physiology, the morphology of their bone structures are similar, but different to other humans. And so now, again, based on some genetic testing, and, and mind you, they could have been testing it. There was blood work done in the 70s that nobody wanted to touch because, again, it showed blood in South America that's not supposed to be there. It showed blood types. There's only supposed to be one blood type. No one's supposed to have a beard, no beards. Uh, everyone is supposed to have the same blood type. And everyone came to South America and got really busy in Central America and North America. The whole thing was done because of the Bering Strait, because of the land bridge approximately 13,000 years ago that a bunch of spear, cha- you know, mammoth killing, uh, loincloth wearing Neanderthal, Neanderthal, whatever, the basic people came across a land bridge, not saying they didn't, not saying that some people didn't get really determined and make their way to America through a frozen bridge structure from Alaska, from Siberia. That's, I'm not saying it's not possible that some people came that way, but Everything that we're finding in South and Central and North America is showing occupations here for tens of thousands, if not millions of years. So without going too far down that rabbit hole right now, the Paracas, if they came from Europe, if they came from Crimea, why are they there? I mean, just to dig for a second on them, my thoughts have been over the last four years that they've changed a lot of different thoughts on it, but I I kind of sum it up as whatever society that they were a part of prior to uh, whatever disaster. And and they were ultimately wiped out either by surrounding tribes or maybe disease. I mean, that that's the current theory is what happened to the Paracas, why they're gone, gone. However, prior to this 9,000 year point, whether they were there prior or post Younger Dryas, the question might come down to, if they genetically really do trace to Crimea, then maybe they just got sick of the rat race. Maybe they got sick of the higher technology society they were a part of, and they said, screw it, we're going to go get high, make textiles, and live on a beach. And we're going to be the first uh, Quaker slash Mennonite slash... Sounds like a plan. Yeah, yeah. we're going to be... We're going to live in peace. All the technology for tens of thousands of years have failed us. We have screwed up the world. We quit. We're going to go just live on the beach and be happy. I mean, that's, I. it's so, I only throw that out there because our true story 
as a human race is so far from being able to be answerable. So there are questions that people have and they want an answer for something so badly they will make up you. And I know you and I have had a chance to talk about this before. Uh, people just love mm-hmm. to everybody was hunting and building temples. If they were not hunting and making a new, mm-hmm. you know, you know, new wolf wolf jacket, they were definitely building a temple. They were the most faithful, <laughs> devout, uh, nothing else to do, no whittling, nothing. They were just they. That's why they had thatched roofs on their polygonal masonry construction because they were too busy worshiping or making statues with really big boobs. It wasn't like your seventh grade. It was. It wasn't your year, whatever it is, how it goes in England, kid who just thought he was funny making a crappy little statue when he's thirteen years old, thinking it was funny. It was, you know, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't ancient Playboy sending you your latest sculpture. It was, you know, under the guise of art. It was always a fertility goddess. You know, it's always a, it's always a temple. No one just had, you know the the soil store the jewelry store it was always if it was built and it's in stone then it's got to be significant it's never it's never uh, uh, it's as if society today has no mimic the rate at which the snail's pace in which we sociologically change is so bizarre that they label everything and it and it blurs the lines of what we're finding because the problem is over thousands of years, places get adapted and they get reused and they get cleaned up and they get repaired. And if you don't have that interdisciplinary, uh, even if you're a geologist, even if you're an anthropologist, even if you're a paleoanthropologist, the issue is you need people who look at construction. There are ways you build and ways you don't. And, and, and in no way do these polygonal constructions for these uh, Paracas or these elongated skulls or otherwise. So uh, on the note of the Paracas, before I make this point, the Paracas represent one group of human beings that clearly have a different genetic structure than what we know as human. I think it would behoove any university, because I'm, I'm after all this time now, I'm calling them out. So unfortunately, I'm going to do this on your show now. Uh, somebody has to have the guts. Someone, someone has to have the guts to actually test these genetic codes. Someone has to have, uh, first off, uh, I don't care if it's Oxford or Harvard, they all have the ability, they all have the, they have the, the money and they have the equipment. Ancient DNA testing is not done like normal 21 and me or 23 and me or whatever the branded, I'm not trying to advertise for, getting your genes tested for to find out who your relative was. But the the testing mm-hmm. that could be done could be a whole new field as far as really uh, redeveloping the paradigm of the human story because you can look at the morphology of bones in the that have been practically petrified laying in the desert or an acceptance of the paleoanthropological record, which Michael Cremo in Forbidden Archaeology does a great job of, there is the nonstop from the minute we start seriously in a scientific method digging crap out of the ground, we find a human anatomically correct record going back millions of years. Not my opinion, not his opinion. These are actual finds where, same deal, I didn't want to top him. I I started thinking after I read his book during the time that I was working on mine. It took me, like I said, but I mean, I, I by the time I found Olav and my publisher, I'd been at it for almost three and a half years. Uh, Olav and I spent. Uh, he was such a great, it was a very great help. But I spent another six months editing. But Michael Cremo spent a decade, what he thought was going to be a nine month project, to bring up some interesting old uh, lost sites. Michael Cremo spent. A decade finding paleoanthropological, uh, anatomically correct human finds in the standard academic record that everyone ignores. But he went around and actually revisited the sites, revisited the field notes, revisited the sites of the field notes, took photos, got requested. And before you know it, the guy goes from an author to on archaeological congresses. And that's if you can't beat him, I guess, make him join the group because what he found was. Uh, tr- was factual 
evidence of humans from California to uh, France being found in layers of the earth, not intrusive burials in situ, approximately 5 million, 20 million, 60 million years old. And, and that means, uh, and we could talk on that for a long time, but what it basically means is that we're talking about a very unknown human record about people that were definitely here. And so what we can tell ourselves right now is that we have, we have a known mystery DNA chain in our bodies right now that has just been identified. And we know there's Neanderthal and Denisovan. And what's interesting about that is the mixing. They've said, well, genetically speaking, those genes mixed with us about 50,000 years ago. That's interesting because that is about when uh, there's a city off the coast of Cuba that's 2,300 feet deep. And this is how, what's interesting about this is that even if you count for, there's one theory, okay, there's lots of theories, but of one of the most credible about how could land drop so fast and how could some land rise so high, like the Recot structure or the Eye of Africa, how could a city end up at two or well 1700 meters deep how could a 1700 meter drop happen for an entire pyramid city and well hydroponics sh- plate shifting is the only legit theory which is that eventually the world's oceans somehow through cracks eventually end up under different uh plates and it causes such uh yeah, essentially a combo of either buildup or evaporated pressure that eventually the the plates, along with their normal shifting, uh, at some point, approximately 50,000 years ago, they blew in a way that caused flooding and shifting. But isn't it interesting that we have a polygonal pyramid city uh, that we have photos of that was found approximately now 14 and a half years ago by treasure hunters off the coast of Cuba that we know we have done nothing with it's very deep but it ties into why is it that about fifty thousand years ago we have denisovan and neanderthal genes well we can start to tell ourselves a different story now we're 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 playing the game and now we have the paracus which is another uh we have i don't even know how many mummies we would actually have available for them to actually test genetic material uh, not to mention the fact that a lot of the practice are redheads. So again, the academic story of South and Central America is that everyone's black haired, no one grows a beard, yet their very gods, uh, like Veracocha, is a redheaded dude with a red beard. And that's why they didn't mess with the conquistadors when they showed up. So uh, again, it's <laughs> the combination of mythology and facts point very easily in a direction that doesn't exist for us currently. And now, now back, you know, to your point about polygonal masonry, this is a society that is moving the most, uh, hard complex quartzite, uh, difficult to cut, let alone on 15 or 20 sides and polished perfectly. But then they're engineering the soil and it has piezoelectric properties and we have multiple genetic lines well, what's the one other thing that we know now about what they could do? Well, we have these giant stone spheres that are all over the earth. And there is a group of Europeans, and I quote their work, and they have been working on seismic metamaterials. And one of the things that they had pointed out shortly, almost before my book was, I mean, we were still in the editing process and I couldn't believe it, but they go, hey, we just noticed that Greco-Roman amphitheaters, in quotes, uh, their foundational structures look very much like seismic metamaterial, as in they built a foundation with pylons to specifically mute vibrational quaking. And even the Greeks, just like the Aztecs, just like the Greeks, or just like the Egyptians, the Greeks talk about the gods built their places first, that they were not the first there, that the gods did. And everyone thinks it's an allegory. Everyone refers to it as, well, you know, the Sumerians knew, they they were pretty smart. You know, they knew how to work with pi. That was just a coincidence. 
They had the Babylonian Plimpton tablet, so they knew Pythagorean theorem a thousand years earlier, but that was just a coincidence. And they worked on a base 60 hexagonal math, uh, hexadecimal math system that was spherical based, which is way more complex than our modern geometry. But they just did that for funsies. It was just a coincidence because their king's list goes back 268,000 years on average to 248,000 years. But they, they, they just didn't know the time. They didn't know math. That, that, they, that, that, that would, it was just an allegory. It was just a start. That, that, would, that, would, that would lead me uh, uh, back um, to a question about that city because you, you know that I, I really, really um, dying to ask about this. So the city off of Cuba, um, how deep was it? Did you say 2,000 feet under the water? Yeah, seven, seven, just over seventeen hundred meters. Right, seventeen hundred, right. about two thousand three hundred feet. Right, two thousand three hundred <laughs> meters so, feet. So, so my question would be, my question would be, how old a does a society have to be to get to a point uh, in social order and technology, masonry, everything else, um, to build a city? And how long was that occupied? And how old was that society from the point of maybe um, uh, club? draggers to that point where they had a thriving city yet that ended approximately 50,000 years ago and you're mentioning the kiss uh, the king's list of 36,000 years the textbooks which we all read on history at school are wrong completely completely wrong yeah it's not like they i know and it's not like they didn't build it and say okay well we're ready for the flood you know this will boggle right. people's minds uh, right, you know, not like they wrote they rode off and waited for it to flood. This was, uh, and again, a lot of, and it cannot be said enough. You know, people for us in the states, the Alexandria uh, sunken. I don't know what it was called. I know it's been going around the world, including England and Europe. But the sunken city tour of Alexandria. I don't know if you've seen that, uh, but it's been traveling no. the world. Yeah, it's spent about, uh, we actually have a pretty incredible museum called the Minneapolis Institute of Art, and it's deceptive because, uh, a perfect confusion, by the way, Institute of Art. So are there Rembrandts, like Lucretia uh, Rembrandts? Uh, yes. Is there uh, Spartan uh, army helmets? Yes. Are there Greek statues? Oh, wait, now, is it art now or is it history? Is there an Egyptian mummy? Yes. But is there also Monet's and Van Gogh's? and uh assorted other artists uh that it's just incredible that uh gogan i mean there's there's plenty of artistry in reference to painting and what's considered in the last couple hundred years art but then there's also our history which is in greek and roman frescas and stelas and uh, again we have an egyptian mummy but that's in the minneapolis institute of art and for a year, we had the sunken city tour of Alexandria. So they've been excavating this city that is off of, you know, of course, the very famous uh, Library of Alexandria and Cleopatra and everybody, etc. You know, everybody knows Alexandria. However, mm -hmm. that's I'm more concerned about this city that's off of Cuba representing like the Bimini Road that Graham Hancock and a number of others have pointed out on a zillion shows that it, we have, uh, uh, particularly in Europe, right there around from Scotland, Ireland, uh, all of England to France, we have dogger land. And this is a significant amount of land that is finally, for some reason, making some headway on ancient origins and some other sites as far as news about how, uh, let's go nanoarchaeology, scientists have been looking at seed seedling samples within the sediments, uh, saltwater sediment, sediments that they've been able to start identifying the flora and fauna of Doggerland, which was, for the most part, above land. Above, it was quite a bit of it was there even 4,000 years ago. A lot of it was there by 6,000, almost all of it. And these are hundreds of thousands of square miles of rivers, of creeks, of mountainy, hilly, Valley, this is all prime real estate that would have been occupied by all of these cultures. So not only is it interesting that there's a single city sitting at this depth, which is a really hard place to get to off of the coast of Cuba, which is very dangerous. It 
there, there's been no other approvals for doing that kind of uh, research to get down to there because it is within Cuban territory. But here we have one example of something that's not the lost sunken city of a contemporary culture, which is super fascinating. But Alexandria, like Egypt, like the Greeks, like everything Eastern, which we just have this magical wall between the East and the West, are societies that have readapted What's there? Polygonal masonry. What else is within the polygonal masonry? Well, there's keystone cuts. That's another aspect of, again, high quartzites, rose granites, granites, basalts, all these hard, 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 but also frequency either uh, resonating or muting or catching, uh, again, computer-like giant stones that are shaped. The technology to shape and cut these stones the technology to move them, the technology to measure that if we build a polygonal wall with these cuts, it will have the simultaneous function to mute a eight on the Richter scale and also send through the piezoelectric qualities of our soil a message to another building or straight to a pineal gland of a human being walking with fully activated, not five or 10 or 15% consciousness, but a 95 or 100 percent conscious human being that can actually uh, breathe, see, touch, smell, taste things consciously, like through abilities like synesthesia, which I know I'm jumping ahead here. But the reality is that this is a society that wouldn't have just built a city off of Cuba. It's like finding Gobekli Tepe. There is just a significant amount of land that we need to, whether it's hard or not, except that there is a significant amount, like off of India, uh, Graham Hancock dived it in the 90s, is there is a significant amount of ruins at a depth and a distance off of most continental dry areas that do not represent a contemporary society that may have even adapted a polygonal site like Egypt, like Alexandria, but further in that the Mediterranean was more of a lake, that the Baltic did not exist as a sea. It was a lake, a very small lake, because Doggerland took up most of that area from Scotland, Ireland to to France. It was it was one massive area that was above water. And then you have this area around the Caribbean. It was above water. It would have made the Caribbean a small lake between uh, Mexico and America and Florida and Cuba would not have been more than just a, a great lake as such. But this is these are just all examples of the excitement available to that the society 50,000 years ago, clearly building pyramid structures. And clearly here we have mystery DNA fact in the human genome that isn't from a society like a Denisia Van or Neanderthal that we think of as primitive, even though we do know that it's so hard because when we picture them, we do these artist interpretations and they always look kind of idiots yet. Uh, brain size of a Neanderthal, bigger. Uh, body, bone density, strength, everything, bigger, broader, badder. So were they dumber? Were they simpler? We don't, we, I, I can't even have that conversation. That's like, we don't know that, but but we have this other mystery DNA, but that's the only one that we've identified recently. And the Paracas have a different genome. So are we directly related starting at 50,000? Again, like you said, established societies at least 50,000 years ago. And how else do we know that contemporarily? Well, they're not idiots in Sumeria, in Sumer. They had the King's List, which has a list that literally says pre-flood kings, post-flood kings. They actually say it in the list. And a lot of the kings that lived after the floods, the last, i.e. biblical flood, the, a couple of them lived like, you know, over a thousand years, 2,000 years, three, three and a half thousand years. But then you got pre-flood kings that are eight kings that are ruling for about 32,000 years apiece. And the Egyptians, Solon, the Greeks, uh, they, many of them, traveled and met the Egyptians who said, you Greeks don't know how old you are. Uh, we ourselves are an old culture. Uh, there's a dynastic kings list for Egypt that goes back approximately 36,000 years, but it still doesn't cut a city off of Cuba that's 50,000 years. But what does it do? Every single one of these contemporary societies get credit for knowing star alignments, knowing pi accidentally, apparently in Egypt, uh, working with all these crazy complex things, but even 
excuse me, even if we count the current Egyptians' ability to use copper tools and they winged it, they did some cool stuff, but they aren't responsible for the original builds, they are quite aware of how to count years. And for them to have a contemporary king's list that goes back 36,000 years, and for the Sumerians to go back even further, and for the hairpin, and again, we have this magical wall to the east. We do not, as Westerners, accept that the Chinese, South uh, Asian areas like Jakarta, the, you know, the, the pyramid that's there, we don't easily accept that these societies were well-developed, developing, and as complex, and not to mention there's pyramids in China, and not ones that were built for Emperor Qin, but they appear to be contemporary with the ones in Egypt and around the world. So we have a worldwide cymatic polygonal uh, society that is not limited, right down to the soil, not limited to a single continent, but we have contemporary stories, including the Hindu Vedas. All well, and and the Vedas. If we give the Bible credit for archaeological finds, why is it that we don't do it with the Vedas, which literally is the oldest, longest running religious and historical text? Because we give the we give the Bible credit for being a historical text, we have to do the Vedas the same way, and they talk about millions of years of history. So if we mute all the various things. What do we got? We have multiple societies pointing to a culture for themselves that are either either almost reach. So like if the dynastic Egyptians have a king's list that only goes back 36,000 years, well, what if that flood 50,000 years ago put that central area out if we were sh- shifting paradigms and said, well, that's the city off of Cuba. Everything went to crap 50,000 years ago, exactly, at the, or 52,000 years ago. And the society that found and adapted and started rebuilding Egypt, they really did start 37 or 40,000 years ago. So there was a disaster and there was a 10,000 year period of absolute mess. But if Sumer is correct and they have a king's list that goes back hundreds of thousands of years, what if? What if it did, but it's echoing to that society that did build the society off of Cuba? So if we started piecing together the physical facts, the mythological storylines, and just use them as a hint, I think we're going to be going in a, where our bearings would be in a better direction now, because here we go again, mystery genome approximately 50,000 years ago, everything goes to crap. There's 150 plus tribes on the planet right now. And they live simply. If we went away and there was no more big box retailers for you to go buy your stuff at, drive a car to and get gasoline or go on a really cool fancy boat or ship, you would be gone and rusted and dusted. And the societies that's still building campfires and, and opening up leaves and using herbal medicines and just living in quotes, harmony with nature. Well, they've existed. They've always existed. So we make this assumption that, well, we'd find a skyscraper, would we? Or would those materials have been readapted? Meanwhile, the societies that live through disaster times, they always exist. There's always a society of humans that we seem to, in some capacity, leave alone if we're not murdering them for their land or their resources. We leave uh, Native peoples alone. And so here we have a time period in history where things go badly 50,000 years ago. And then we have this marker, and maybe it was plus 50,000 years ago because we have this marker. Do we want to intermix with Denise Van and Neanderthals and this other mystery race? Or were we mostly the other mystery race? And even though we have a genetic marker that says something else, so how many actors are we? Uh, and what's the what's the scene of the disaster or the movie where we have four to seven at a minimum races of humans uh, contemporarily living together? 55,000 plus years ago in either harmony or some contention, things go bad and we have this reboot and 
dynastic peoples, uh, as in the Aztecs, Mayans, Oltecs, uh, uh, Toltecs, Olmecs, uh, the assorted other native cultures in Northern America, uh, Asian, Harapin, Egyptian, Greeks, they, they, they take over these mysterious Etruscans, the mystery name attached to a society that looks like it was probably Tartaria and goes all the way to Siberia. And we never talk about Tartaria. We have, we have Greek construction in Mongolia all the way to Greece, but we're never going to talk about, Tar- I'm sorry, I digress. Should not bring up Tartaria right now. But oh, you, we you have go ahead. Very... Oh, really, really. You go ahead. I, I, just, I just like to, I just like to reiterate that, that, that there was a, a. We're saying about let's just say thirteen thousand years ago, there was a, a catastrophic event. Um, no, or the, the the time period was the geological geological time period was Younger Dryas, and there was a catastrophic catastrophic event. Um, probably um, a, a meteor strike or a couple of meteor strikes. And uh, that affected the whole planet. Now, my, my question to you is, is this what ended that society? Maybe a dumb question. Is this what ended that society? Because if, if it hadn't, we would all be, uh, you know, we would be far, far more uh, advanced than we are now. Is that what stopped the clock? Is, is that what actually ended it? Because I, I know you've talked about in the Amazon with uh, LIDAR scans, there's vast areas of buildings and evidence of civilization is is were they the survivors is that where the survivors went or is that that basically ended the younger dryas period just ended the, this point in history the possibilities range from uh, robert shock dr robert shock's suggestion the geologist has theorized that there was solar flares uh that's a possibility uh meteors that is also Gosh knows we've been hit by a few. And then, of course, that 19-mile diameter uh, one in Greenland, that's one heck of a hit. 19, uh, so, you know, we're talking 20-something kilometers across diameter impact that caused the equivalent of at least a 460-megaton bomb going off. And that, and, and, the, and, the, and the estimates on that say, well, and I think they're being optimistic. Uh, oh boy! It's a kilometer under ice. They have identified it through seismic testing and and satellite imaging that this impact in Greenland would have, uh, you know, it, it's either approximately thirteen thousand years old to sixty five million years old. They don't know. And and then we have the Yucatan. We have, of course, the what used to be called the dinosaur killer that hit in in mexico and again that one is labeled as the one that took out the dinosaurs and so we we do have uh, probably who knows how many unexplored hits around the world that could be the actual explanation or it could be a solar flare i don't think people understand that driving around personally in an electric car is not my idea of a good time i i want to have a car with manual brakes and I do not want electronic controls. I mean, the sun, you are just playing with the devil. If I'm right, if I'm right in saying there are um, a lot of underground cities, um, if there's one in Turkey, I think there, a, a guy found it, he was renovating his house or something, not to all down. There was a vast subterranean city, absolutely huge, or at least could be described as a bunker for thousands of people. Could you maybe... Yeah. Um, Talk about that a little bit, uh, because that would tie in nicely with uh, uh, people hiding from such a catastrophic event. Maybe have been yeah. Happening. So that's the other. That's one of the things I'm writing about now, which is I, I could not cover it in my first book, and it's uh, the whole point is that we have this modern interaction with what we're calling UFOs, but based on the ancient technology and what we're finding genetically and uh, sorted other reasons, I think that th- this society got quite advanced. I do think just like the tribes on earth, they're all here, that they're still here and that these underground rock cut ruins that range from the Andes, from Peru, from the Paracas, from that region where these giant megalithic buildings are, uh, Eric Von Danigan and Buzz Aldrin of the NASA space program actually met quite contemporarily. They met 
to look at some of these rock cut ruins that are in South America. They're in Central America. They're in the United States. They're in uh, Turkey. And, and some of them, of course, were, you know, they get shrugged off as medieval, that they were used for medieval mushroom. St- I love this. It's mushroom storage, wine storage. Uh, but this is a vast underground complex that has large rolling stone doors that lock from the interior, not from the exterior. They lock from the interior and they were found and they've been, they've been found in uh, all of middle Europe. These are not world war one, world war two. They are not ancient, uh, uh, root cellars for mushrooms or for storage of can or jar goods. These are very ancient, large complexes, uh, as far as South America and, that whether it's a tunnel or a passage or large cavernous rooms, I'm talking like six, eight story warehouse size, where these are these are definitely constructions designed to not only house, but to store food for thousands and thousands of people. And that means that they would have had to need to be underground. Now, if you're building, I mean, here's a no brainer, uh, just from me having a background in construction. And if I was if I was doing city planning, and I was using wood and metal and assorted other stuff. And and you can kind of get more of a game plan because over 50,000 years ago, if you look at the construction methods and they're using large cyclopean blocks and they're rock cutting all these, they're cutting through the hardest, like the Aztecs are not going to cut the tunnels. The, the tunnels they were cutting were insane. They're not, there is no tool that the Aztecs or the Egyptians possessed that can account for some of these underground passages and chambers. Something that gets left out, by the way, we're talking about Turkey. When I was a kid, I was fascinated by one statistic about Egypt, that 90% or 95% of Egypt, Egyptologists will say, lie buried. Uh, What they don't tell you is there are kilometer after kilometer after kilometer of rock cut and well-built underground, when they mean mostly Egypt's underground, literally there are that many unexplored, massive underground complexes that interconnect and are all over Egypt and they haven't even begun to scratch the surface. It's crazy. The amount of... What's the reason for these subterranean... Sorry, what's the reason for these subterranean... uh, Are they shelters? Oh, yeah. So, yes, to your point, if you're a society that lives through catastrophes. And if our paleoanthropological record appears to be correct, humans have been here for millions of years. Well, they would have seen a lot of disasters. And at some point, groups or all of them would have advanced to a point where if you're going to build and if you're going to stay fresh after a massive cataclysm, having constructions that are large and well-built will be able to withstand floods or fire, but vitrification. So like you said, the last disaster, this younger Dryas, it could have been meteoric. It could have been a flood. It could have been a combo meteor flood, solar flares, because there is vitrification. So it's a high heat melt and then cool down uh, an irregular. We're not talking from someone building a campfire We're talking some of the ruins in Egypt, like Tanis, which was the capital of, it wasn't Cairo. It was, it used to be Tanis was the ancient capital of Egypt. And it looks obliterated as in a wave of, of heat and, or it could have been, we haven't touched on it, but it could have been weaponized uh, frequency wave terrifying. If you look at the technology to cut and shape, not only the blocks, but to mess with genes, to engineer soil, the kind of scalar waves, like so we're talking Tesla uh, scalar wave technology, the kind of weapons you could create that would act as high heat microwaves and and the kind of uh, weaponizing or impact weapons uh, like kind of pile driving slug, uh, shake the earth sort of sonic. I mean, there's there it's just terrifying the road you could go down from a weapon standpoint. But if you are going to survive multiple catastrophes, weaponized or natural, having a massive amount of rock cut underground safe passages where the majority of the surface of the earth is not manageable, then you're going to want to have these cities, whether they're in Turkey 
and allegedly uh, the stuff in Turkey connects to things. And I'm this is some research I'm working on now, but they there is there is conversation that some of these rock cut ruins actually connect to the Central European systems, and they are at multiple depths. Uh, just like in Egypt, we're not just talking the sand covered them up. We're talking some of them are easily 40, 50, 60, 80 meters below the earth. And they are not just a tunnel that is small. We're talking large, again, cyclopean, well, rock cut constructions. And they're found here in the United States. So this is a society that is clearly planning to shelter from incredibly severe weather, severe heat, severe cold, severe uh, wind, uh, just patterns of earth weather that it requires either permanent or semi-permanent residency underground. And it appears that it was worldwide. And I don't see that happening based on what we find. And when you look at everything, because it's kind of mind blowing and boggling, but that this society at some point uh, constantly over periods of thousands of years had to take shelter and did it at various levels of comfort. It, it, it very much looks like they did uh, protect themselves and or uh, connect each other through these tunnel systems that were meant for mass transit. But that, that existence is gone. And then I can't fathom how many rock cut ruins as in uh, like Petra for people wondering, these are entire cities. A lot of people think Petra is just the big bank building that was in Indiana Jones with Sean Connery and that, you know, they ride away on horses. But Petra is over 12, uh, well, so it'd be about 16 kilometers long. And some of the rooms and some of the spaces that are cut at Petra are over 320,000. Oh, let's go. Let's, oh gosh, Jared, do some math here. Over 110 a thousand cubic meters in size. These are rooms that are that big, and they're wow. and, and they're and they show machine cutting. They show that's the other thing is that whether it's Egypt or any of these polygonal sites, they show uh, rock machine cutting that is very disconcerting to any Egyptologist or ancient archaeologist. Where it's like you can't explain away some of the depths or the widths of some ancient quarries. Again, showing the same thing, not contemporary quarries, but quarries showing cutting with blades that are thinner, stronger, faster. Uh, they're all gone now, but why? Why are they gone? And those are some of the questions that are just killing us all to answer. But they clearly knew how to survive a disaster because one of the things we're not accounting for, we've touched on it, but... The technology to move, cut, shape, and measure uh, not only these large stones, but to equate them to the earthquakes they're canceling. So the wave and frequency technology to do all of that. And then engineering soil, we're just making an assumption that that's where they stopped. I mean, we're just on the edge now of nanotechnology that includes 3D printing food, 3D printing organic. So not only are we printing meat, uh, which has now been authorized for for sale, so you can now buy chicken nuggets that aren't from chickens. But you can. Uh, we're talking about printing. Eat. Oh God. Really? Yeah. So for those of you who oh, don't want to kill animals anymore, but just eat meat, you're going to be able to do it because they're just going to grow meat on a plate. And so we're getting we're getting really close to you being able to walk up to a wall, Star Trek style, and order a meal and have it built on a plate in front of you, right down to what you want to drink. And that, that means that, uh, for instance, right now, they are growing livers, hearts, ears, uh, you know, sorted appendages. So they are able to take cells. I mean, you, there is a vast amount of technology to unpack here. They are able to program a machine to squirt out living biologies to not just print, but to uh, program parts of the human body. So when I say it's not aliens worse, it's us, it's because when people say, well, look, I am a, I have met, I mean, I'll, here's a, here's a one for you. I have met a uh, retired, very straight laced, not into any alternative research uh, architect who said when I was, you know, gave his time and age and description, 
of when he saw a fleet of UFOs stop literally over his head. And this is not a guy that has any interest Mm -hmm. in UFOs. And I think so many people now with the technologies we have in cell phones and everything else, uh, there, yeah, you can fake it, but there are many, many, many real interactions. And so this is why it's important to think about this 3D printing technology and what we know about the human genome. We used to think there was no double helix. There was no DNA. And then we figured out DNA. And then we figured out double helix. And then we figured out there's a quad helix. And then we figured out, well, it's even more complex than that. And all, all of that leads us to when you want to change something about the human body, you go get... Uh, you know, you go get plastic surgery and there's some pretty common ones. I'm sure out there, everybody can high five each other about what they appreciate. And then if you like right now, the most um, advanced, I, and we can talk about hidden military technologies, but right now, one of the most advanced things on the planet is Mm -hmm. the American F-22. And we're talking about, and it's not the only flight system that has it, but we're talking about a fighter jet that has direct brain weapons uh, and assorted other communication and display systems able to communicate from the human brave, just from a brain, just thinking the, the co-pilot is able to control a number of systems just with thought pattern. So I want you to take 3D printing, the technology we have today, and consider a, a group of people that have terraformed the planet, have uh, controlled and or muted uh, waves and frequencies of not just earthquakes, but the very uh, earth circuits, grids, like the Nazca lines and the Bolivian Nazca lines and the Jordan Nazca lines and this engineered soil as piezoelectric properties that there wasn't just one genome. And on top of it, that gene expression after all the disasters and everything we've gone through and all the dynastic peoples taking over the planet, we keep running into either we're the most popular anthropological study in all intergalactic history and lots of anthropologists from other places come here, or that there is still very easily with impunity a society of humans that are advanced enough that when they want to do onboard display systems with their navigation systems and they want to fly a Tic Tac and it can do zero point turns at Mach 30 and maybe being smaller, white, translucent skin for wave and frequency communication and direct thought pattern analysis that onboarding with big black eyes. So when you see a in quotes gray or fill in the blank, call the alien, whatever you want, it's not an alien, it's us. Because we have that ability to not just engineer the soil itself, but but genome and not in an alchemy sort of way. This is just a technology. We know that there's no reason for cellular death. The singularity by Ray Kurzweil goes into this and other nanotechnology. They considered it, you know, this is a co-founder of Google University and I'm not promoting that, but Ray Kurzweil is like a living Leonardo da Vinci. The guy has, I mean, when I read his book, he had over 260 Mm -hmm. patents, I think. And the reality was to try to explain to people today what nanotechnology means when even 12 years ago, we could create nanofactories that were made out of a few atoms. We're talking like 80 to 150 atoms. That means that's really small. And you could put a nanofactory in a body or anything. And then the nanofactory could make other little nanobots. Or, 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 it, or in, in soil, maybe. You yes. could put it in soil. Yep. Uh, that maybe we wouldn't recognize yes. when we're looking at it because you're you're talking about um the, the the printing of body parts and I'm kind of thinking to myself yeah and the F16 brilliant but we kill, we still cannot make that soil right uh, that that is amazing that's mind blowing so you only find like Michael Cremo said it best he's like you only find what you're looking for you know if you're looking for shard, pot shards if you're looking for a seed if you're looking for like a very uh, chemical residue of yeah, we have mummies in Egypt and it looks like they have cocaine in them and it looks like they have marijuana. It looks like they have tobacco with that's only grown in South America at this period. How can that be? And then uh, there's a weird story, by the way, side note about corn. Uh, I know you heard there was a interview we did. At, oh yeah. Yeah. I've heard, yeah, cool, yeah good, but yeah. I, I like America unearthed is the first place I, I, I know Scott Walter and he, uh, he did an episode of America unearthed. And it was about how far did the Aztecs or the Mayans or what did Central American society really look like? Is it possible that they started in America or Utah or Arizona or got as far as uh, Wisconsin? Because 
Wisconsin, Minnesota, uh, Wisconsin is next to Minnesota in the United States, middle of the, you know, right near the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior on the other side. And here's the deal. This is a state that has corn in it that has a, gen- a genome structure. Corn is a weird thing. It has to be maintained by human beings. There's no, if human beings go away, corn, as you know, it is not going to look like there's not going to be fields of corn. There will be no corn. So the corn in, uh, some of the strands in middle of America are 9,000 years old. And that's just from what they've tested as of yet. So someone, not, not anybody, not random herds of dogs or deer or moose, there's nothing that is going to propagate corn. This corn had to be managed by humans and it was being managed 9,000 years ago. So that means settlements. And the other problem is then you have other, whether it's wheat or something like a maize, like corn, it's going to be, there are genetic signatures that if you don't want to find what you're looking for, or if you find something that looks like it's very uh, anomalous, it gets thrown out. So this is a big problem right now in archaeology. People have to protect their incomes. They get funding for jobs. And you have to stay within a tabled theory. So instead of tabling the facts, if you find a fact that doesn't fit the theory, you have to throw the facts out. And there have sadly been many cases of this. So now, if you're not looking for ancient engineered soil, if you're not looking under, this is my biggest point, is that as a construction guy, as a remodeler and someone who deals with structural loads and building on or adding onto a building, it occurred to me that like Saxe Waman or Ollante Tambo or these other places with these large intact megalithic walls, well, you have to build those walls on a foundation and, and a normal home in America, which, you know, we're pretty young. I mean, there's homes on the coast that are, uh, you know, maybe closer to 300 years old, but, you know, go to Europe, there's 700 year old houses and they're, they're not, or they've been occupied even longer, but some of them, uh, I remember being in a wood home in uh, Germany, northern Germany, that was 900 years old, almost, eight, eight, 880, 850, and it was made out of wood, and it was still standing, wow. And which is great. But how do you get billions of kilos of polygonal masonry to stay straight, even dynastically over a few thousand years? Well, here's a not sexy subject that ties into not sexy engineered soil that I think is the most sexy subject possible. And I've talked to some archaeologists and we are planning some (laughs) trips on this that no one's done. Get a core sample of the complete composition of the structure of what these polygonal masonry walls are standing on. Because we make an assumption that wherever the walls stop, or by the way, this is something also that bugs me about surface material sciences. We assume, well, they built a big block and a common one about Saxe Waman and some of the other sites in South America, uh, they point out that, oh, they, they, you, do you see how they knocked in a snake? Like the shape of this polygonal block is a snake. Okay, yeah, but was that done by a later culture? Or was that just a base for a finished material? Because I think if they can take, uh, you know, to 13,000 feet and from 75 to 500 miles away with the hardest stones on earth and cut them to be 15 or 30 sided and big as hell, I think they know how to use plaster or uh, a finished uh, wood or plastic or metal that they could easily have a finished material on the surface of these buildings. And the other assumption is that, well, they built these really big rock walls, but they didn't have a plan for a roof. They just threw some grass. And so what if we're looking at the, we we, we could be looking at the basis of structures. We have lots of apartment buildings that we're building in my area that the base is concrete. So it's about 15, 18 meters tall of concrete. And the bait, and of course, there's a lower level for car park. But then above that, it's five or six or even eight to 10 stories of wood construction. And well, what would happen mm-hmm. after a fire, after a thousand years of, of whatever? You would have a Saxe Waman or a Ollante Tambo, or you would have the foundational materials. You would have these polygonal walls. But getting back to the foundation and the soil, Whatever, 
was on top of those buildings. And over those tens and tens of thousands of years ago, when we had forests of sequoias and redwoods that were 60 feet in diameter and hundreds of feet tall, not the scrub trees that we all go around and look at right now and go, oh, you know, trees, are, trees aren't very big. We're talking, uh, uh, we're talking a 165 meter tree that you can look up right now called Hyperion. They didn't find that tree. It was. It's in America. Uh, G- National Geographic's talked about it, and done an interview, uh, done interviews, and done some stories about it. But Hyperion's an old redwood that's that's about 165 meters tall, and and we didn't notice it till 2008. So for a society to chop up a bunch of really complex stones in a really complex way, to then support a building that could literally be laid out in a, you know, 20 meter diameter uh, cut wood blocks and the kind of cutting tools and machines and shaping, all of that's gone. But for now, let's talk about the foundation. They had to put down, when we do a little stupid foundation for our stupid little homes here now, we dig a three meter hole and we, we, we have basements because we have tornadoes. So in my area, they would pre-compact the soil barely one meter. For one meter, the goal is to pre-compact, whether it's uh, dirt, uh, clay, sand, because it we could have been a swamp 250 million years ago. It depends on where you are in, in my area. But whether it's clay, uh, dirt, or sand, or all, you dig a hole, you run this tamper, which is about uh 90 kilos give or take maybe 100 and it it, it's gas powered and it tamps the ground and nobody does a test nobody tests the soil they just assume that it's 90 so what you do is you pre-compact the hole then you put in class five gravel which if you've ever driven down a dirt road i don't know what they'd call it wherever uh you know in europe but it's just a rock and a sand it's crushed, it's from a quarry, and it's usually what you coat a dirt road with. It's mostly this sand and this crushed rock, which is reasonable for tires to go over, and it flattens out the road, and it stays fairly intact even if it rains, but it's called Class 5 gravel. It's also what you use for foundational material. A lot of builders know this. So you put like a a half a meter of that in, and then you pre-compact that, and then you put in some sand and some more rock, and you pre-compact that. Then you set your forms, and now that that's 90% pre-compacted and barely a uh, half a meter thick, maybe a meter now, no, not even, a half a meter, and now you build your foundational wall that you build your house on. Well, what does it look then for a cymatic polygonal? Here's the sexy. Here it is, the big sexy, is what if those <laughs> billions of kilos of polygonal cymatic walls are sitting on pre-compacted foundations that are 80% or ni- or 90 or or are they 105%? Uh, do they seem like they're stone? But what if they're made out of a crushed material? And I have to credit a, a Jennifer Deo, an archaeologist friend of mine uh, who I'm planning work with. She's like, Jared, no one's ever looked at this and no one's ever thought about it. And then she gets wide-eyed and goes, what if like one of, what if it's like, 20 layers what if it's 10 layers of material what if one of the layers is a crushed shell from brazil but we find it under a polygonal wall in greece what if uh the layers are 30 feet or 40 feet thick what if uh the layers that are holding up these polygonal walls and keeping them level are made out of crushed rock from a quarry at aswan but you find it in olyante tambo what if uh, these are the signatures. We don't have core samples. We do not actually know how thick or the the very machines. Like I'm talking about a tamper that's it's a it's a heavy weight that pounds dirt for a a a, a, a third of a meter wide path to build a foundational wall for a, a cellared home. When I'm talking about polygonal walls that could be four or five meters wide and what is the material that they used to build those walls on and guess what we don't know we don't have that knowledge 
And those wall, those walls have not moved at all. I mean, they yeah. are solid. Yeah. They are. I mean, it's Saxo Oman. If I'm if I'm thinking right, Saxo Oman has. I think some of the biggest stones are uh -huh. two hundred tons. Oh, they're even bigger. Uh, that is that is oh, uh, incredible. I saw a video of Brian. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, Brian Forrester standing in front of one of them. This one block is eight hundred tons. One of them. Oh. Oh yeah, and it's famous. You'll recognize it if you Google it and you look at it. one of them. One of them is just. Mm -hmm. it's 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 crazy or internet search it because i'm well anyway so the uh the site just as that example yeah this this it, it's not there's no it's no sexy there's no mummies there's no gold there's no hordes there's no jewelry uh there's no tools there's no spear points it's not it hasn't been uh it was taken for granted like, even if I'm wrong, like, okay, so the Inca didn't build the whole structure and they threw some rocks up on top. Well, yeah, it kind of matters by a thousand percent because the story we're telling ourselves is so daft. It's so limited on our history. It's so, it, here's the thing. This is not a big shame fest. Grab the pitchforks and burn every uh, anthropologist, archaeologist, and, and it's not you know, point out every Victorian idiot. This isn't, that's not the point. I mean, I mean, we're talking about a period of history where women were not supposed to be allowed to vote. You know, <laughs> this is, there's a lot of things we can fault. Mm, every, yeah, right. every period in history has their perspectives. But I do think that our awareness of this is partially due to the number of total humans we have on the planet. I do think it is genetically related. We're not even, we haven't even scratched the surface of genetic information and technology and how mom. Can, can I ask you, can I ask you why you're, why you're touching on, you are the only person I have ever, ever heard um, say about the diversity of the different races on this planet. And as far as my understanding to your talking about that, that the size of globe we live on uh, and the different climates does not warrant the different races. No. Uh, it, it, and you're the only person who's uh, brought that up. And I think, do you know what? You're absolutely right. It Thanks. And it's just the data, it always confused me as a kid. Uh, two things. I, I grew up. Uh, very Irish Catholic for wh whatever stereotype that brings to mind for everyone. But I grew up very Irish Catholic with a very specific uh, process of, you know, how the, all that happens from first communion through confirmation and all the church clubs. And one of the stories that gets me right away as a kid and makes a huge impression is, a, is the Tower of Babel. And as a child, it makes, oh, okay, well, God didn't want everyone to talk together. But he loves everyone and wants, and the earth is a gift, but he doesn't, if they, if they all work together, they can do anything and that that's going to be bad. So I'm going to make sure they can't talk together. And I always like from the minute as a child that just hit me as, well, well, there seems to be a lot of contradictions in that. And then, uh, scratching my head constantly at the races, like why, why all the races and Part of it is our contemporary, again, our theory of out of Africa and the reason atheists or however you want to describe yourself, Western religion believes that the Garden of Eden is in Africa. And that mixes well with, of course, scientists who say, well, I don't believe in the Bible, but uh well, you know, maybe the Bible has a myth that's related to a possibility of something that's true. And what we're seeing is, oh, well, it appears based on our genetic information that it's out of Africa. We all came from out of Africa and that's what we're going to stick with. And then, hey, what about what's going on in Asia? Oh, no, no, no. There's nothing happened there. Don't look behind the green curtain. And so now we told ourselves this genetic mapping and again you find what you're looking for i've never thought that life on this planet was a, an accident of fate and happenstance i've never thought that we just developed from monkeys and life appeared from nothing i'm completely convinced that something or some things had a conscious and intelligent um, there is a theory that has just been pushing like a bulldozer for years and it's out of Africa 
and this is the uh, you know the mutations and genes uh, easily dictate well that this is why there's asian people and this is why there's uh africans and this is why there's white people and uh fill in the blank and and uh, and south america it's just we have this uh again it's a theory that again we were all a nomadic we were all just sorting stuff out from caves we all linearly progressed progressed out of africa and eventually created society and we did it all over the last you know tens of thousands of the last tens of thousands of years uh gobekli tepe is a problem because that wasn't supposed to be there yet all of our ruins right in our face, including the Egyptian pyramids and what's in South America. And everything we've been talking about all exist prior to the history that we want to say built them. And they've ignored it on a genetic level because there is not really, despite our amazing ability to mutate genes, there are a number of things about the human body that we cannot explain. Like what is this missing genetic code by missing, I mean, what's this mystery? Like we we apparently have a contributor to the human genome and it was about 50,000 years ago and it's not Denisovan, it's not Neanderthal, but you, you guys weren't even sure that there was three or four and now there's another one, but then what about weird abilities like synesthesia where you can take colors and numbers and sounds and you can see them differently in your mind's eye and the theory of evolution, part of it says you only get something through a forced adaptation. So how is it that we're only at 10 to 14% consciousness? And don't say that it's relative to the human brain size. The reality is that if we only get something as we are forced to adapt to it, then at some point we must have used 95 or 100% of the brain. But yet we're not doing that now. So I like to describe it that we're in, you know, you've heard me say we're in a safe mode like a computer that just can boot up and get to the BIOS and you can still fix and do some basic stuff, but it's, it's like, it's a safe mode. And we look at technology again as external, like the devices we're on and these uh, problems we encounter in communication, but, or satellites and TV, but we don't look at technology as in viruses or funguses that the technology, the switching, the bio switching needed to turn on, not the mutation of gigantism, which is how we describe people who end up at a height that are not you know, appropriate to what we think is average, yet we know that the height of humans has continued to go up. At the same time, we have biblical and many uh, period, just across the board, native to, and by Native American, I mean something in North America to all over the native peoples, tribal peoples around the world. We have stories of giants. Uh, not one mile high giants, but just people who are maybe eight, nine, 10, 12, 15 feet tall. Those are, those are examples where we kind of shrug it off and we go, oh, well, you know, that's a mutation. Well, <laughs> everything in our genome is some sort of a program. And we have plenty, too many stories in contemporary mythologies, mythos, religions, spiritual books, whatever you want to put them in. We have too many stories of either giants or little people, and they are in every culture. And then again, or when it gets described as dwarfism or midget, uh, whatever the other technical points are, we think, okay, well, it's an anomaly. It's a mistake. Well, again, there is the assumption that we have a clear picture of our history, which we don't. And of what we're finding, we had a very complex human society that at a flip of a genetic switch could produce super tall, super short, and don't let it get away from people to get it in their heads right now that we've gone very far away from Dolly the sheep to now creating designer custom babies. That's a thing now. And that's scary with every sci-fi that comes with it. How hard is it then to change someone's not only skin color, eye shape? I don't think it was a custom mod for the sake of religion or for the sake of uh, uh, some myth, mythical reason. I think that there was great functionality and diversity. It could have been built in diversity uh, for the most part for a number of different reasons. It could be a biohack backup, but we don't look at the different races around the planet 
and think that it may have been atten- intentional to perhaps a skill set or a job or that it was a choice. We think that it's a default. We think that everybody came back from, if not Adam and Eve, from, again, there's a duality. There's two vertical stories. There's one is this atheistic or, uh, again, I guess, irrelevant to religion. There's a there's a mythical story a, or, or a, a faith-based story, whatever that is, East or West. And then there's this other story that is scientific that says, well, at some point lightning strikes the pond, like you said, and eventually there's two slimy crawly things that ultimately evolve into people. And that is a very huge, unfortunate jump, either assumption. We constantly take technology that we don't understand or science we don't understand and we, and we mythify it. And this is a case with our genomes. We have the Paracas. They're not the only ones, but we have, got, despite mummy unwrappings, we have, which was a thing in the 1800s and 1900s to unwrap mummies. So despite that massive failure of preserving our ancient past, there are still thousands and thousands of mummies that we can get genetic information out of, which would give us a better snapshot of who's being buried, what and when in uh, the dynastic Egyptian periods. We have burials found all over Europe. We have the Paracas and all these other mummies that really indicate, you know, you have red haired, red bearded white people in Mongolia. You know, they, they are said to be slightly possibly older, but the reality is we have a significant amount of genetic material available, ancient genetic material that is still salvageable from a various amount of sources that could help give us a better snapshot as to some of the mystery, the deep mystery uh, bits of DNA that exist in us. And not to mention, we're still discovering what that is. I mean, we, we walk around dusting our hands like we have this full grasp on not only the genome, our, its functionality and our history, when the reality is that it's not all worked out. I mean, the highest level of technology is not printing a heart. The highest level of technology is sending in a nanobot that can strictly just literally plug and play a couple points in a DNA strand. And suddenly, not only do you not have cancer anymore, but now you're 26 or 30 or 40 or have the strength of a 20 year old and look 35. I mean, the the ability of the human body to be repaired and managed is simpler, simple cellular programming that doesn't just stop the anomalies. I mean, we could go off forever on uh, weird, uh, where do, where do dogs come from? And I don't mean from wolves, but why is it that sequoia, the big trees that you can still see in California, the, the there used to be meta sequoia. What, where are they? Uh, what about organisms that we're just starting to understand that are very large, like Pando, the, the tree system, but now we've discovered a fungus network that's larger than that. And that's over 40,000 Aspen. And now with our genomes, and these expressions, whether really tall or really short, we, we make this assumption that it's a default, that it's just this random selection and choice rather than a safe-moded uh, terraform planet genetic interconnected system that used Earth circuits, piezoelectric soils, uh, waves and frequencies, activated pineal glands, and abilities like synesthesia, which are so trippy because they're they, these were... Uh, abilities that were studied even by the Greeks, Carl Jung, and early uh, modern, in quotes, uh, uh, psychologists, doctors, uh, they were looking at psychiatrists, they were looking at the ability of being able to sense, like watch two people touch each other and feel what they're feeling. And like feel like you're being touched, Uh, hear a number, see a color or hear a color or see a color and have a, uh, uh, have a number or a number and a smell words activating as if all the senses could be played with like a symphony, including some descriptions of having like dimensional synesthesia, where if I said to you, 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, in in space in your mind it like not just your mind's eye but in front of you seeing a 10 at a great distance and then a nine and an eight and a seven and a six and a five until one's right in front of you why would we want or how useful 
would those abilities be that right currently the population on earth is said to have 22 to 26 percent the synesthesias and that there's different formats and that there are different variations but it's mixing uh not only all the senses but there was a case at the turn of the century where a russian in particular had the ability to memorize every single word of every single conversation of every single thing he did on a daily basis. He could remember all the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, you name it. It unfortunately on a sad level was so complex. He had to live alone eventually. And eventually he was able to manage the memories in his mind as if they were memories in a computer and he could delete them. And that's a whole nother deal. But imagine being in a society where you could touch, taste, feel, uh, connect with each other, and not only that, but geodimensional and spatially based on sounds. Uh, imagine walking up to that giant cymatic polygonal block that you need to look to be a 700-ton, 10-sided, 4-meter wide, 6-meter tall, 12-meter long. Uh, it's going to have a whole bunch of different cuts in it, including a small cut for a little, uh, just a 30 by 30 centimeter piece that's going to fit the entire length and set a bunch of other polygonal blocks on it. But you throw on the Beatles or Led Zeppelin on your headphones, and what you see projected in front of you is a map of colors on this block that, based on the music stimulation in your brain, shows you purple where you should only see red. So you don't care what the measurement is. You take your high-tech sonic device, whatever you're using to cut this high quartzite crystalline rose granite, and you're able to shape away the purple color you see projected from the music you're listening to. And when the purple's gone, you're done because this other section is showing yellow, which you want to turn red. And so you polish, shape, and cut a block without ever knowing the sizes or measurements and whether it's in some type of frequency, anti-gravity, whatever the device is, you've cut and shaped a stone entirely based on sounds and, and senses that had nothing to do with a tape measure or measurement. It had to do with sounds and depths by projecting onto the block the colors and you and you see the finished thing. Like Michelangelo described, I saw the David, I took away the extra rock. But in this case, it's the same thing. And, but this would be one way synesthesia could be applied in ancient high technology where they're shaping what's like what what we're thinking of very mechanical devices would be projected like, well, like there's laser levels now. It makes you, it helps you make a straight line on a wall when you're going to throw up some shelves or cabinets, but think way more complex, but simplex in that they're able to rely on science and technologies that also equate into the human genome, where if you're going to change someone's height for work in small areas or uh, stronger and taller, if an average human right now, we're up to the guy from the Game of Thrones, uh, the giant or the mountain, I think he made a squat uh, record uh, a few months ago that was over 1,100 pounds. Uh, and this was a squat record. What's, what's the squat? What's the, How much can someone who's eight feet tall squat or nine? When you go beyond just a human stretch of seven feet, what, what happens when you have a nine or 10 or 12 foot tall human? How much can they lift? And that's not a simplex explanation for oh, well, that's how they made polygonal construction. That's that's quite an oversimplification because they're not lifting, moving, and shaping the complex-sided masonry because it's just something they can do because it's it's, it's, it's about just earthquakes. There are too many ancillary technologies that point towards a nanotechnology that we're not looking for because it's not a matter of just getting under an electron microscope and going, hey, look, we found under this polygonal uh, foundational wall, not only were they crushing up different kinds of stone, but it looks like there are uh, seismic metamaterials that are so many nanobits in size and they have this shape. And this shape causes this wave to vibrate this layer of the foundation, which changes the energy pattern. And it looks like they could cool heat or communicate away or to or from or resonate a building based on this nanostructure. And 
we're not looking for that material, but this is a society that could easily sit down within a, uh, uh, you know, what you're going to call a Greek amphitheater, a open air half, you know, horseshoe shaped amphitheater. And we make the assumption that that sound and that resonance was about listening. What if that sound and resonance was about communicating to the audience that you sit down with cancer and I sit down with a cold. And by the time they're done putting on a play simultaneously, there's waves and resonance and frequencies that are just simply being absorbed that cancel out. Just like Anthony Holland's work right now, killing leukemia and MRSA. You can watch this on a TED talk. You can see modern scientists destroying cancer and MRSA and leukemia and bacteria and fung. This is incredible. And Anthony Holland was doing this in a TED talk from America in 2008. And that's incredible. But back in the day, we're talking about a society that could manipulate, uh, not in an alchemy way, but just direct programming. We just, we don't have enough of a fossil record based on a society that was clearly wandering the earth with multiple human genome lines to say, well, there's just a random selection of Asian people. There's a random selection of black people. There's a random selection of uh, white people. You know, how, I'm just, I'm really simplifying this. So I apologize because I don't want to leave out uh, Mayans and Aztecs and um, uh, Native Central American and uh, Asian populations that we just have this gross assumption that everybody just kind of buggered off of Africa and just decided to randomly start somewhere else. And that just isn't that 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 timeline is just not correct to what we're finding in the ruins and the complexities of those ruins. So we have things like Gobekli Tepe, which we brought up a couple of times. But what a lot of people, given that we've only dug it up, we've only got five percent dug up. We know that because they've done seismic testing, and they know there's more columns, there's more circles. They know just at Gobekli that. They're at 5%. And of what they've dug up, you got these massive, and, the, and and there's been some early reports about the complexity of those pillars. But yet again, when you look at the structures, they've been surrounded by uh, river rock or just crushed rock. And so the, again, just to point out, the anthropological artist interpretation is uh, very simplex walls with thatched, you know, grass roofs. Yet, the complexity of the pillars show that they would be more than capable in cutting and shaping wood. And so we don't, we don't really know what those original structures look like, but we have an idea of what the very last culture that adapted and used that area that has been dug up may or may not have been using because we have to get down to the layer that the society was at. And then you got to look in the dirt. You have to look for those engineered soils. You have to look for what they were planting you can't say uh, that we know what those are, but we know that those are dynastic survivors from some younger Dryas event, and we know that they're in a time frame that help us, you know, guide us towards these larger, more complex histories that I think upset everybody because, well, it's like taking any book and putting a pinhole in the cover and saying, "Well, you tell me what the book's about." It's just. It's just, it's just hard. And so this is exciting because when it, I know one of the things we were talking about before we got cut off is genetic memory. So all these fields that everybody keeps thinking are separate. Uh, some people have paranormal experiences, some, and they call them that that's how they describe them because that's the sense they have about it. Some people have spiritual experiences or near death experiences and and, it, and again, they chalk it up to a faith-based, which I'm not saying it can't be. I'm not saying it isn't. The difficulty is that we are a very complex creature with, like Graham Hancock says, a, a society, you know, we're, we have amnesia. We're just a society with amnesia. We, we don't remember. And when you're operating at 10 to 15% consciousness, you're only going to see things to a, with a certain clarity. So no matter how much money you've made or how much power you have or how many traditions you've had for a thousand years, you have to understand that you're making discerning decisions with 10 to 15% of your brain. And it's only with the advent of the billions of people we have now 
that we've gone from the limited imaginations of someone incredibly brilliant like Leonardo da Vinci, we've gone from thinking of corkscrewed flying contraptions to graphene conductors and nanotechnology. And that is not just a science that we're, it's not a matter of like, you know, a few million people in the Western world or in um, very developed technological labs across the world, irrelevant to development of the nations. It's not that it's just a few people that have come up with that. I'd like to make an argument that the collective human consciousness, which even in a standard academic model has been proven out, that and based on the amount of engineered soil, which also could have been for a highly industrialized society that needed to filter a lot of air, something we should be thinking about. If the very soil that we could lay around the planet could be filtering the air, we could solve a lot of troubles because it looks like it was already done. So if it was also for a larger population, and you could really take everyone on the planet right now and put them in two South Africa's or three Texas's, you know, or three Spains, you know, if you could really put all the people, that's how unpopulated the planet is. We have the ability to feed everyone. We have the ability to take care of everyone, but the total collective human ram, the total collective human consciousness has expanded to the point that we are aware that we can consciously control our immune system. We are aware that different sizes and personalities and functionalities may lead to being each other's backups, like a Harvard group of scientists took a 50,000 word book in 2008 and stuck it on some uh, genome uh, using the human DNA, the, using the RH, RO, all the different uh, four different chemical switchings. They were able to basically turn the human genome into a uh, basically a one and a zero. And that means today we're up to about a gram of DNA can hold over a terabyte of information. But we know that as long as that genetic genome is passed down, but also we know this from things like instinct, and we know this from uh, studying, actually, ironically, we're up to worms now, but we've studied that you can pass a traumatic memory to a, a child, that, that, that there's an actual imprint of this. But what we haven't entirely gotten our heads around in the world of what we do know of vibrational medicine, of the very serious field of the quantum, uh, whether the, the cult of bumping particles, shout out to Ken Wheeler, uh, it's maybe not the cult or duality of bumping particles, but that everything is a field perturbation that we are in a very, our understanding of magnetism and the waves and frequencies of the universe and how we are actually constructed down to a holographic image as explained by Burr in the 1940s at Yale. Uh, the reality is that we have a very limited understanding of our consciousness and how it collectively lives and how we don't just pass down the memory of an experience, but that the very total human population is of value to everyone. So for those listening that think they're all powerful and that a collection of the human race is not worthy because they live very simply or that they're poor. The reality is that we can very easily, we don't need to really chat about how easy it would be to really feed and house and take care of everyone. But the reality is we don't understand the connectivity between all humans and what we mistake for maybe our own past life or past experience could be a stored, a deep stored genetic uh, memory, as long as we keep birthing, that not only do we have an energy that's actually about us, literally about our own field, and not in a woo-woo way, but also in a highly connected genetic technology way that that we do not disappear, not just because we're a simple code, but the complexity of an individual human is stored collectively either in a cloud or i.e. download or through our constant birth that the idea that the mythology of reincarnation or the idea of ascension the reality is that people all the time remember past lives and there is a possibility in my opinion that it is our first little sliver of truth into the window of understanding how complex we had become before this massive last catastrophe 
this final last one knocked us into complete safe mode where either we on the planet weren't part of that group in those rock cut ruins or those people who survived were not maybe the creators of a lot of that ancient technology, but they didn't share. And now again, we, we see what we think are people that are possibly alien to this planet, or we see vehicles that are not acknowledged by any known military U S or otherwise that are not theirs, that they're saying, this is a UFO. You guys all saw it. And the assumption that they're from somewhere else needs to be taken into account that, it's not that hard to throw on some antenna and say, I'm an alien, I'm from somewhere else. So do you think that uh, the teachings of Wim Hof, which I know you practice yourself, that is part of who we were to be able to withstand uh, amazingly cold temperatures uh, and high temperatures as well. And I know you practice this as well. Do you think that's part of our genetics? That's what we could all do at one time? Yeah, I. I had the advantage, I had the pleasure of meeting Wim Hof when he came to America for the first time in San Francisco, and I got to learn how to do the techniques and what was interesting in listening to him. And at the time, he still held 26 unbroken world records, and that's super fascinating to uh, be able to, you know, again, it's 20 below zero, and you can run barefoot, and you don't freeze your toes, and you can maintain your heat, and you can sit in ice up to your neck and climb Mount Everest in just shorts. And you can do all this and maintain your body temperature. But he also did it when I met him, he had just done it 50 miles in the desert and Stanford uh, neuroscientists have been researching him. He's been studied at uh, the U of M uh, in the hypothermia uh, aspects in the wing. And then of course he's been studied all over the world. He's been studying in Rotterdam. There's a documentary about, I have controlling his inflammatory response to a bacterial, uh, a dead, basically a dead form of E. coli. And he trained a series of other researchers and in 10 days, in 10 days repeated this process. And I got to listen to this man speak openly and say, all of us forgot how to do this. All of us can do this. He goes all over the world and teaches that everyone can do this, that we forgot it's it's his one of one of his very famous quotes without saying it the way he would uh he would say it full up but he'll say effing demystify stop you don't need an effing prayer you want a prayer he'll throw his hands together wave his hands and go there's your prayer he goes you forgot you can do this your kids can do this you can do this this is your ability these are abilities that are ancient and they are yours and they are for all of us and the guy just goes on and teaches and i think it's a pretty brilliant ability what drug company wants you to control your inflammatory response by breathing literally and this isn't like do it and uh, this isn't do it and learn it and oh you know i've i i figured out how to do it uh, wim taught people how to do this and you can watch the documentaries and then they were all these these researchers were all injected with this bacteria and they all meditated and they took blood samples and and the next thing you know they're going through the entire test again uh with an inflammatory response that's being controlled by all of them after 10 days of training this is something that is truly incredible because we think of uh you know i uh, I've brought it up before where people just go, I'm pretty sure I used to be Cleopatra. Yeah, well, why aren't you Bill the crap collector at the elephant zoo? You know? Why oh why why are you always Cleopatra? What why are you the why are you the King Druid of Stonehenge and you ruled for fifty thousand years? What why aren't you just the guy that polished shoes? And the on that note, I think there's two important points. There are people who say, I'm pretty sure I was a dairy farmer and I lived in this area and it's someplace they've never been. And granted, as we discovered, the human planet's been incredibly populated on the skeptical side. They go to a place where they think they've been. And there are many examples in the paranormal world, uh, which you know we started to talk about in the skeptic, where it's like, wow, this person's never been here. And it looks like there used to be a farm and it looks like it might've been dairy or maybe it wasn't, but it was still a farm. And, and so a farm that we didn't even know was there and we thought it was barren. So there are people who do have memories, genetic memories of living on the planet and being something somewhere 
that wasn't special. They weren't Mark Antony. They were not Julius Caesar, uh, but they were, but they do recall something and they don't recall it on a fancy side. However, we have a lot of romantic ideas. We have a very powerful mind and part of collecting into that collective uh, ether could be that you can activate those memories, that being. So where you you feel like those tastes, sounds, touches, just like synesthesia, they're so real that theoretically speaking, my opinion is that you could be accessing that stored that stored person, that stored experience, that it's actually there still, that that is something that you might credit yourself with saying, I was this person in a past life. The reality is you are accessing someone's past life and you are accessing their existence in that collective human consciousness and or within your own genetic memory because you are, as an i.e. everyone on the planet's valuable, uh, everyone's backup. Everyone is everyone's backup. There isn't... Uh, it's quite concerning to me when people are going around, the hubris it takes to say, oh, there's too many people on the planet. Really? Because it looks like we supported a planet that had many more people on it than what's even currently here, and they didn't have a problem being fed. Clearly something went wrong, but was it that natural disaster? Was it weaponized? Was it an external attack? I mean, we can keep speculating on that, but as far as genetic memory goes, it's a very complex subject, and it absolutely matters that we dig into it and we don't look at uh, people. We don't want to wave off people who say it's paranormal. We don't want to wave off people that say it's spiritual because here's the other component. We don't, it's not that we're not spiritual, uh, ever loving, lasting beings. The issue is we are relating to a shared technology uh, at, at one level that is simply that it's a shared technology. And even if it was developed by us, it doesn't mean that it's not special. It doesn't mean that it's not organic, but we are possibly still in a phase where we're mistaking what looks like in quotes nature for what is really a complex biological. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cut in here. What are the, what are the funniest things that you've explained before in other interviews and I only have to put it this way because it really makes me laugh, and it's so so true. Is the blinky button? Oh uh, yeah, I, I. So for thousands of years, or a thousand years, uh, if you bang on the blinky box, uh, and if you do the ceremony because you've developed a ceremony after a thousand years, and I always say that blinky box is, you know, it blinks orange on the left, it blinks red on the right, and then somebody walks up a thousand years later and says. Uh, why are you banging on the control panel to a 747? That's a that's a plane. It flies. And then you get a large resounding cry of heresy. Burn the heretic. And and then uh, <laughs> but just because you are mystical, uh, you know, spiritual, believe in fairies, uh, you could literally fill in the blank now with a million. And this is the danger of a group of people who think they're more valuable than other people. The reality is that if you do something for a thousand years and you've recovered a piece of ancient lost high technology and it's given you a reaction, or maybe it no longer gives you that reaction, but there's memories and memories and books and stories, and there's a, a, a blinky box ritual, you might be getting a reaction out of a control panel or something and you think that it's spiritual or religious or even scientific, you think that because it has magnetism is a great example of there is a description of what magnetism does, but what magnetism is, is something that I really have to credit after a lot of hours of research that Ken Wheeler, I think, is really the foremost expert in the world on what magnetism really is right now. But these are all examples of sciences that we have a consistent reaction and use for, and we've been able to uh, really laser guided in on have a predictable response. But when it comes to our genetic memories and when it comes to how we relate to our past, uh, we've deified uh, reincarnation. We have a paranormal explanation for why we hear footsteps or see astral projections or people or past lives. We think that it's a uh, uh, a past life. Uh, well, we have a label for it, but what we've done is we're getting a reaction out of the blinky box because it does blink yellow or orange and it does blink red. But in reality, 
just because you're getting it to react doesn't mean it's the highest and best use of that technology. It turns out you should probably set a destination, pump up the tires, throw in some gas and fly the damn plane. But you don't see it as a plane. You've been stuck for so long and looking at it for so long as something that it isn't. It's become the blinky box that gives you the great orange and red, uh, you know, pitcher. And that, that, that is a problem because now you're, you know, we're, we're misusing and misidentifying and misinterpreting and deifying or mystifying, or even worse, creating a uh, scientific theory off of a subject that has nothing to do with what the object is and does. And we do it all the time. And so we have people who don't or are very esoteric. We have people who are, you know, they're going to dance around. I, I'm so sorry, but I, my, one of my other examples is looking at people with flowery wreaths and walking around at Stonehenge every solstice. And it's like, look, if you want, if you want to do, that's the other thing I guess I say is if you want to, if you want to do yoga at Chernobyl for a thousand years, it's going to be a thing, but guess what? It's an old nuclear power plant. You, if you feel tingly, get your, get your Geiger counter. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't, it's not a problem if you're, uh, you know, if you're again, finding, here's the problem. All of us together, if we don't do self-experimentation, if we don't do research, however, and whatever reason has caused my genome to manifest the way it is. And then we, we, we can't even touch right now. We don't, I, I'm not saying we don't, but talking about like conscious water, how the chemicals and the makeup of not just magnetic fields, uh, externally, but how we our positive gene expression, what you eat, how you work out, the like whether it's the Wim Hof method or breathology, like Steak Severinsen stuff, or if it's uh, another methodology, if it's more Eastern, uh, like some of the Hindu traditions. Uh, but when you demystify and you apply these uh, breathing techniques and meditations and exercise and food, but when you also add in something so complex about structured water, we're talking about Victor Schauberger and Johan Grander and Dr. Imoda Masuru. The reality is that the very liquids that make up your body and the very energy fields around you now create not just a paradigm, but an expression for where you're at. And we are all slightly disconnected. We are okay. We're all really broken and disconnected from this giant uh, terraformed uh, earth geo grid that we were a part of. And so the reality is each of us in our own way are valuable in their experience, uh, not just because of that collective human ram. So I think people really need to revisit whether or not as a side note about whether or not we can afford to lose 30 or 40 percent of the people on the planet or that in reality the collective human consciousness is creating the space for us to come up with brilliant nano advances even if you're not the smart one but that total collective ram is related and now as we're disconnected and broken each of us though have this personal self-experimentation where wherever your gene expression is at and whatever your memories are. And when you go places and you and I have talked about this is that when you have a super strong connection or recollection, when you are at a place like Stonehenge or at a Henge or at Egypt, at one of the ruins, at one of the polygonal sites, one of the really, I'm not just talking two or 6,000 years old, although it's totally possible. There's things like second sight. There's a lot of different real, like the men that stare at goats, which were really dogs, which, um, about, uh, uh, you know, remote viewing. These there's all very real uh, connections on a on a level that we're just kind of revisiting that all relate to the fact that we don't know. And so, when you if you're out there listening and you're relating to something paranormally, or you know it's a spiritual thing, don't change the mm-hmm. way. I'm not saying change the way you are relating to your experience, but be aware now that you are a very complex creature that has some serious badass programming put behind you that you do have abilities to unlock and abilities that are part of a total collective human experience that is much more complex than not only we've led to believe, but you individually only by your own self-experimentation are going to contribute to the solution. That's why I think whether it's a museum, a university, or the Vatican that has a massive library of ancient things, why 
we are also drawn to watching shows about ancient things and traveling and touring. And like you said, if you just go to a place and I have a connection with it, the reality is, is that each of us are relating, I think, differently to that collective consciousness, our own stored genetic memory and what we're what we're all personally in our own space uh, capable of connecting. And that's why this is not a subject where it's just uh, for a, a yogi or a spiritual person or an archaeologist or a scientist or a nanotechnology sort of person. This is not an area. Our our entire collective human experience is only going to be uh, decipherable if we really take, if we don't take the time to listen to everyone. And that seems daunting, but Again, there's groups. We've made up groups. There's the paranormal. There's the spiritual. There's the uh, uh, just the science base. There's this uh, quantum base. There's the cult of bumping particles. The people who believe in Newtonian physics and that that somehow simultaneously waves and frequencies are also particles and 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 yet that's a theory and so is an electron and uh, when you get into but even oh. even even the even the at, at, at the, like the the subatomic level here uh, you have things yeah. that uh, such as quantum entanglement uh, and I mean, when you were talking about water and the, uh, at home we have like a, a water filter and fun fact uh, i put a copper pyramid on it now this is not a new age i call things like this old age i put a copper pyramid on it and i put crystals in the water okay i don't form a drumming, drumming circle i know for a fact the water tastes better i absolutely do <laughs> yeah well it's 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 a lot like that 747 blinky box thing because you to it we might as well be at the point if there was ever an appropriate analogy for all of it it's got to be the monty python holy grail and Arthur at the bridge with the knight that won't let him cross and he's chopping off all of his arms and legs and he's like, tis a scratch. And you're standing in front of something that is so ludicrous. I mean, any modern builder, any average carpenter, a uh, tradesman of any kind, even a plumber. Oh, not to mention something else we haven't touched. The amount of plumbing that's in these ancient sites, uh, like the Nazca lines rarely pointed out. Uh, took Eric von Danigan when I met with him and he's like, Jared, you know, the Nazca lines are, are plumbed. And I said, what are you talking about? And he goes, they're plumbed. So even if there is water, there's a drain system. Do you know how many people have looked into the complexity of the terracotta and the, and the drain system that's been put into Nazca? And I said, well, where does it go? And where does it come from? He goes, well, one, it's a drain system. And two, it comes all the way there. There's piping that goes up into the Andes. So there are too many out of place, out of time artifacts. There's too many things like the P. Reese Reese map that uh, there's many other maps, but the coast of Antarctica with no ice on it. And again, for those that want to debunk anything, here's the deal. There's a lot of elephants in the room, a lot of elephants. And one of them that has, uh, thank God, you know, she got crucified uh, back in the 60s. But Virginia Steen McIntyre, who Michael Cremo championed in his book, she was a geologist who was brought to a site in Huayatlaco, northern Mexico. And the archaeologist said, well, we need our, we need geologists here because this is geology. Well, kudos to you guys for bringing in the experts. They bring in these eight, nine geologists. They make a solid assessment. These are people in the 60s with their reputations on the line. And they made a solid assessment that they were at a site that was 275,000 at a minimum years old. Now, this site was for a campsite with tools that indicated for sure, absolute positive human, anatomically correct human population. This is not Neanderthal, Denisia Van, subspecies, monkeys, you name it, fill in the blank. No, these were humans. And the archaeologist came back to Virginia and said, uh, oh, you don't understand. Uh, here's our playbook that says, this is uh, the time when people came to America through the Varian Sea Land Bridge, and you can't date this to 275,000 years. It's just literally not possible. So you have to fix this, to which she and some of the geologists independently published on it because, well, that was the facts. So you have to repute just, and the house of cards falls. So then you got to take the Paracas. And every single 
ancient genome looking genetic scientist, how the hell you can be looking at out of Africa and showing me pie charts of how you think. And by mind you, they do it. And, and that, that, that house of cards is starting to fall because it has to do with where Neanderthal and Denisia van genes show up. And they, and they think because of the lack of, or the, or, or the consistency of that, it must've all started in Africa because of where and how it, but we don't have a full, uh, a bone record. We don't have every, Anyway, the point is, is that you have to start with the Paracas. You have to explain uh, the fact that it was well known by early turn of the century archaeologists. Again, part of it's what's not taught in school anymore. So we have a problem when early, like the father of South American archaeology, who I write about in my book, and you can read all about him. But one of the things he talks about, it was well known that the Chinese had come to South America and Central America and possibly California. It was well known. They, They knew that. And they talked about it. It's it's in uh, it's in the words. It's in the names of cities. It's in uh, it's just it's in the genome. But the fact is, is that it wasn't just Polynesians, and it wasn't just uh, an isolated area. Because of those uh, lidar scans that we talked about, we're talking about uh, in Central America in Guatemala. The archaeologists are now saying we have grossly underestimated, grossly underestimated the populations of Central and South America. And we can safely assume at a minimum, there was 15 to 20 million people here. And that's just something they were willing to say publicly a few months ago, well, whatever, a year and a half ago. But now uh, they have to complete a 5,000 square kilometer LIDAR scan. And then on top of it, they they, they then uh, had stated, we have to look at South America and Central America as a place where societies may have been formed and started. Because one of the things that we didn't talk about polygonal blocking is that Teotihuacan and other giant temple complexes that believe, you know, there's places people like to go on vacation. They like to go to South America. They like to go to Central America. They like, they love to go look at some of the big Aztec Mayan pyramid structures, but something that's rarely pointed out and you can see it. I, I did post some pictures recently and I, I'll be highlighting it later, but the uh, constructions are polygonal cymatic blocks. So you have these little mud bricks and these reconstructions by archeologists and or uh, by the, by the Mayans or the Aztecs where they've added on these very primitive constructions, but these temple structures are not all small bricked constructions they show signs in Central and South America of also suffering from dynastic peoples or survive, i.e. survivor cultures that came into an area that had been destroyed. And then what they've done is, is they've adapted the construction and they've repaired it and they've done it with much simpler constructions. But in the mid building, suddenly you'll have a 150, 200, 300 ton uh, polygonal block and You'll see the same block at Baalbek, Lebanon, but it's in the middle of a bunch of mud bricks. It doesn't add up. But outside of having a serious look at the geology or at, from the methodology of construction by anyone who builds anything, then we have the Paracas. You have to, as a center of higher academic learning, Start grabbing these skulls and testing them, not hiding them away in the different museums where they do or don't come out on display, uh, not systematically trying to eliminate this as an option. The reality is, is that you there are many, many sites like Way at Laco that we could spend another couple hours talking about. There are many other things besides the Paracas, but you can't have this big of an elephant in the room if there's one thing to do right now. It's test the genome of the Paracas and really learn everything you can about every mummy that's there. And at the same time, uh, some of the work that I am planning where we need to look at the very foundations of these structures and we need to explain why Terra Preta and other engineered soils are not just in Australia, which was supposed to be Aboriginal, uh, and South America and North Africa in a time frame when none of this was supposed to even remotely have anything to do with dynastic peoples. So we have a, we have a lot of big problems with the story that we're told of our history. And, and for those that are just casually poo-pooing things, start with these questions, start with Waitlaco, start with uh, the location of Terra Preta, 
start with uh, the the Paracas in general. And then there is, if you go to, I, an, I can't think of a specific article. I love Science Daily and Live Science. Uh, both those, I have nothing to do with them. I just, I like going there. But Science Daily is a little more complex to get around, but they have papers, they have scientific research, and there are some, quite a few stories that are making the, well, if you want to call it mainstream news, about the out of Africa theory finally getting kicked around a little bit because they don't treat Western, the Western world in quotes, which from, from all of most of Europe to uh, South Africa to America doesn't treat Eastern uh, mummies, doesn't treat Eastern history the way that we treat the Greeks, the Romans, the middle ages, and of course, modern uh you know, we think of the Renaissance and we think of Central Europe and I'm blooming out from there. And then, oh, eventually we got the Chinese hooked on opium. The end. That's that's our short modern Western history. And it's just a really uh, blatant abuse of the complexities of Hindu uh, religious scripts, which if we tr- if we treated Hindu religious texts with half the compass bearing that we've given anthropologically to the Bible, we have some scary mysteries, like the Book of Enoch is uh, foundational to going, it looks like Enoch was in space, and it looks like he was looking at the Earth from a spaceship, to the Hindu texts talking about battles of the gods. And you know it's been well documented now and, and discussed in public arenas and on TV. And But again, they're... They're talking about cities. That's one of the things you do with these historical texts is you go find the actual cities that are in the ground, uh, which Michael Cremo continues to do his own work. A lot of people don't know that also is that besides being a part of archaeological congresses and doing anthologies, he just released another book, but he does actual work. And I think you caught an interview we did that I did on conflict that we were talking to Michael about a city that looks very strange to him because there's a wall that's 5,000 years old. But yet, that's the youngest wall. <laughs> and it's in an area where there's not supposed to be civilization. So what do you do if everything else is 15, 20, 30,000 years old? But you have to have that conversation. So the question isn't, am I saying anything that isn't true? Uh, or you know, for those that want to OCD on accuracy, we, I'm all about tabling each of the sites irrelevant to the specific ones we just discussed, which is not even a fraction of a hole in a, you know, a pinhole in a paper. The the reality is that there are so many significant, not uh, narrative supporting finds that we have to just be okay with not knowing the answers, but knowing that these facts are painting, despite us having zero writing, or understanding of it, uh, which, by the way, includes uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, Mohammed uh, Abraham, who I talked to a few weeks ago, uh, was talking about ancient Egyptian is not entirely known, let alone how to speak it, let alone how to... And he speaks it, but the way uh, we read the ancient hieroglyphs, he's giving it maybe a 45 to 60% in translation understanding. And we have millions, we have tons, literally, of cuneiform tablets that have not been translated. So just because we have one Babylonian Plimpton tablet showing the Pythagorean theorem a thousand years before it was done, doesn't mean that there aren't more weird. And and again, if you're a frequency wave-based society, you would have spherical-based math. You would definitely use pi. It's an Egan value, first and foremost. You use it for frequencies and waves. That's a thing. But we don't have our eyes on it because we find the facts we're looking for. So for now, it's exciting because everybody listening has probably been kicking around ideas. Everyone that's fascinated in this you don't have to do much more. Try, try if you want to try consciously controlling your immune system. I would say definitely go for that. You should definitely try the Wim Hof method or check out Steak Severance and stuff at Breathology. Um, I think that practical application of gene expression, practical application of of not just eating 
higher quality food, but eating for the biochemistry of your body to have a gene expression that allows you to not only not be sick, but feel the best you've ever felt every day and open up some of these pathways to these higher consciousnesses or connectivities between each other, or if you want to call it spiritual or paranormal, uh, it doesn't matter how you bang on the blinky box. What matters is that if you're getting it to work, it's, it's, it's documenting it and it's talking about it and it's being excited about it and it's not being afraid to express it in words you understand it as. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you this. This is quite, this is quite a, 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 an unfair question, but you're more than qualified to answer it. I'm going to give you a trip through time. Uh, you'll be perfectly safe. If you want to go back to the big bang, you'll be fine. You only get one trip. So where would you go? And when to when would you go and why? Oh, that's brutal. Um, Sorry. <laughs> wow. So I'm always revisiting. You'd probably be like you'd probably be like a child in a candy store. Well, yeah, because there's different there's dumb contemporary things that I can't help but want to experience. Like there is uh, there's definitely some Roman and Greek and some. Uh, 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 dynastic things that I think would be really interesting. Knowing what I know about South America, knowing what I know about um, the 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 existence of these massive super highways and roads and things that are in South America. Well, I want to hit that cymatic polygonal people and. So I want to hit that period that is likely pre 50,000 years ago. So I'm going to, so the problem is guessing. I don't want to show up in that window when they're getting God smacked again. So (laughs) bad bad idea. Or, you know, I don't want to open up the time machine door to see everything that they're literally have gone to war and they don't agree with each other. And that's what caused it. You know, they're busy you know, taking down, I mean, the desert patterns around the planet are very ominous. I mean, yeah, we've proved out that North Africa now it's, it's come to the, the numbers have been accelerating. So I've now heard that North Africa was green even 6,000 years ago, which is great. And you can say, well, you know, jet, jet patterns and uh, the jet stream changed and arid blah, blah, blah. But yeah, you know, you look a little towards Mongolia, you look at the Western United States, you look at uh, Africa, and it's really hard not to look, or Australia, particularly the center of Australia, it's hard to look at these things and go, that just doesn't look natural. It just doesn't look like that wasn't like a weaponized thing, you know? And, really? but, but anyway, that aside. Really? Is, is that what, is, really? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? Really? You're, th- well, you're thinking it, that was deliberately it, created? Well, you you got to think like where were these? Okay, so we have millions and millions of square miles of land. The over fifty thousand years ago, let's say there's a sweet spot, and we include the Sumerian kings list. So let's just say that there really was eight kings or otherwise. Let's say that they did have kings that went back two hundred sixty eight thousand years, and between that and fifty thousand years ago. So let's let's just take a sweet spot of like fifty five or fifty six thousand years ago, back to that 260,000 mark that there was definitely an existing worldwide culture in that window. And then we could probably tweak some dates and times with, I mean, cause the, the Vedas say there were millions of years of history, but um, a short dumb answer I could have given you is I want to go back to when the clerk store spheres were rolling around and people were using them. So there's that. And those are estimated between two and a half and three and a half billion years old. And, Wow. I'm saying that the, and they're, they're found in South Africa and I got to see them and I have pictures of them. I'll be, I, um, anyway, so yeah, I've seen them on this time. Yeah. So they're, but, and I've also watched a guy, a Russian on YouTube actually melted one back down and, and reforged it. Um, interesting. But so I don't get the desert patterns. Like they don't, I get it. They're deserts now. This is where the jet stream is. Jet stream moves around. We have histories of, you know, they're talking about Antarctica. You know, again, Greenland used to be the North Pole. Our planet has shifted uh, outside of that. I I find our desert patterns 
I get how they naturally occur eventually. I'm just suggesting that it appears um, it, it, it appears that it could also be um, retaliation and or a, a worldwide conflict. But we're not going to have a lot left from that, you know. We're we're not going to have, um. We're we're not going to have a lot of indicators of that. Mm-hmm. You know. So what what we we only have the deserts we have left. But what we can do is right now we rely on very large archaeology. We rely on, like we have no ability to. Uh, a lot of roads are getting crushed up where I live, and they're rebuilding them and they're pulverizing them. They're reconstituting the concrete in order to use the geopolymer again, in order to make another building. It's incredible. The idea of it right now to us, but the idea that nanobots or nanotechnology would be able to measure and reconstruct down to a crystalline, like a a fracture that small, that we would have the ability to reconstitute a building I, I see it as possible. So we, we don't, we don't write, right. We don't write now, but the idea of being able to go in and dig 60 feet through the sand and get to, uh, layers that may have been there longer, start with that first, but then ultimately when we have to get to the sand and say, is it really impossible for us to reconstruct what was here? and We might live to see the day that, you know, one of the first accomplishments of continuing development of nanobots and nanotechnology and quantum computing and spintronics, which is, I I just love this stuff, that spintronics is going to lead us down the road of being able to uh, reconstitute and quite realistically piece all those pieces of sand back together, back into the buildings they were. I mean, right now we know from... uh, I've been rereading uh, Arturo's, uh, Arthur Pazansky's uh, uh, stories of Tiwanaku and how, you know, local people quarry the rock away. So, you know, send out a dust of nano cloud and without even violating anyone's real uh, personal privacy, they could send out nanobots that could measure and computate the sides of structures and ultimately come back with measurements that could account for the breakage and what appears to be magic just fill in the missing blanks but i don't think north america was just native populations nor do i think that it was like the dolmens and standing stones that are around the earth some of them are just very complex large megalithic blocks and i do believe that they are remnants of a of a higher technology society. And again, you got to combine all the data. It's not about just uh, some random things. It's, it's the level of technology. It's the level of complexity involved in measuring and cutting and tooling. It's the, it's the anomalies in the human genomes and in other things like uh, trees, plants, animals, funguses, not to mention the fact that we're finding four to 5,000 of them a year and have been for 40 years. And everyone talks about the planet dying yet. We don't find, any time to apparently barely talk about it. It was last summer that we found our first organism that lived in the ocean that does not breathe oxygen. It does not do that. It lives out of the world of oxygen. And how many other places or planets or people could evolve and live without oxygen? I mean, that is a possibility, but I don't know what, um, just, just you know, uh, answer me this. The, the, your you you. Uh, ufologist wants complete disclosure um, for any interactions the government uh, are having with extraterrestrials. Uh, they want it laid on the table. Um, they'd all be unemployed. Obviously, they have nothing else to do. Um, but, Jared, what is it that you want? What is it? So if, if you could, I mean, would you go to the Vatican and say, right, open your libraries. I want to know. What is it that you personally want? It would be really great if there was just an open... It's a it's it's literally a worldwide task. So, on one, there is a lack of awareness. Even that, every I know it sounds so cliche. Every life on the planet is valuable. 
that the collective human consciousness and our ability to just be aware of abilities like everything we've talked about from Wim Hof and synesthesia, that the very awareness of these abilities are because we've re-reached, we're reactivating some consciousness through population. So I think that that has to be an awareness, but then what we do with people that they think are not valuable, part of that is uh, we have a massive monumental task in discovering what's under the trees and what's under the soil and what the soil is. It's a massive, massive task. So there is a physical... Will that will that help our future... Gen- sorry, I'm sorry to talk over you. Will, will that help uh, humanity? I mean, knowing the truth from the past, who we were, what we're able to do, in your opinion, would that help humanity? Because basically we're going to hell in a handbasket. I don't mean to be a, a doomsayer, but say it as it is, Jared. Yeah, I do think that there's, because there's a misunderstanding of what's spiritual and what's maybe biologically technical, what's paranormal and what's genetic memory and or all the above, I think that there's so many confusions today. At the same time, there's new discoveries, so there's a half full. And I think that the past is not just relevant for us to say, oh yeah, well, what does it matter? It matters because there's such a high level of technology in the past and they failed, whether they failed naturally or also through war, whether they failed and or despite the technology, they had terraformed the whole planet. I think that it was very connected. I think that it was very well tuned. And it wasn't just this random, uh, there's a reason we're drawn to uh, golf, course, golf courses and Japanese gardens. There's, a, there's a, a deep genetic memory there. And it's not because it was pretty. I think it has to, well, it's pretty, but it's, you know, anyway, the, the, the point is to, in order to rediscover all these abilities, it's going to take literally, like you want to get up and lose weight, lose weight, because it also has to do with having some positive gene expression. And then it has to do with working out, but it also has to do with uh, breathing techniques. And then once you're doing that and you're tapping into uh, the cloud or the grid, or you want to call it uh, consciousness or uh, whatever, you can connect in a way that you haven't connected before. And when you look at these old things like the Vatican, I would I would like a collective database, uh, not one that was too skewed, but you could digitize every object. A lot of universities are doing stuff like that. They're digitizing their collections, but putting them within context of the society that they were found in and not spending we need to we can't spend 30 more years uh p- putting a vase together which although it might be a very pretty vase and have a cool history on it we need to not stand at the ticket counter at Disney World piecing together tickets when we've never explored Disney World you know in the world of archaeology we we can't like we identify how many years is it going to be after they've identified through the LIDAR scans that there are 60,000 buildings that they haven't excavated? 60,000 buildings of a contemporary society that was abandoned. Was it abandoned 1,000 years ago? Was it abandoned 2,000, 3,000, 6,000? Are those constructions going to contain megalithic polygonal cymatic blocks? Or are they going to be little mud bricks? Are they both? Are they built on top of one another? Is there engineered soil? We have we have 60,000 structures just in Guatemala with a with an arrow that you could hit to right now. And then you have Sarah Parkak and what she discovered in Egypt before she got the TED Prize and then has been exploring South America. And the reality is that there are citizen archaeologists. You can join the Global Explorer team. You can actually look at plots of land. You can join that program if you're part of a university system. Uh, the problem is this information is hoarded. And it should be public. So I would hope that all the information could help trigger people's genetic memories. Everyone's personal journey can contribute. Instead of just directly worrying about what you can memorize or what you can retain, be motivated to uh, work consciously on not just general kindness, but again, your gene expression. And that will lead to revelations. And in those revelations in your daily life, and combined with looking at the ancient past, we will uncover it collectively, but it's not going to be one or two brilliant people. It's going to be all of us working together, I think. And shows like this and us talking about it and continually bringing that awareness to people. And it might be a lifetime of raising awareness and it could take a thousand years to make this happen. 
I hope not. Jared, uh, that's us coming up to the top of the hour. Um, please tell people where they can find you and um, just tell us about your book, where they can get hold of it, because I know that they can get a signed copy rather than buy off of Amazon, which may be cheaper, that we can get a signed copy. Yeah, so uh, unfortunately for everyone out of the United States, um, I found that shipping to Australia and England, it's because uh, I sign the books for everybody. So if you want to sign a copy, you can go to notaliens.com. It'll also show on my main page of uh, the interviews that I do and where I'm at in general. You'll be able to link to those once they're recorded and up. I also have a member area. So if you do want to buy a couple books, you can either do a year membership or a six month membership on Not Aliens. And I'll be adding up exclusive interviews and data and research for the work that is also ongoing with archaeologists and people that I'm working with to plan new digs and sites. So that's a fun thing. You can buy the book on Amazon and get it shipped from wherever your Amazon location is in whatever country you're in. But I do like sending out real books for people. And that is going to only be, uh, of course, from me in Minnesota, which means that there is a crazy shipping cost. Um, so to get a book out of country, just email me from, at Not Aliens. It's on my website or from my YouTube channel. But the real Not Aliens also. But really, everything's from the website. And you'll be able to get a signed copy. I send them out. And that's fun to get. And that's about it. So I really appreciate you having me on oh you're absolutely welcome Jared. you've done me the favor um i've really really enjoyed our time together my door is always open to you and uh when your next book's out if you've got the time i really appreciate it if you came onto the show yeah i would love to and we can certainly talk about anything i know it was a. am sorry i kind of went quick on some of the topics but uh Whenever you got time to go over more, I know your uh, interview schedule is going to be picking up with a lot of other stuff. So maybe we should have a chat again in like a month. Brilliant. You take care of yourself, Jared. All the best to you. Thank you. And that was the Jared Murphy interview. When I described him as an all-round good guy, I absolutely meant it. I just need to put this out here. Overview. The podcast. Okay, the sound quality wasn't great on my end, but it's a learning curve. But Jared's was perfect as far as I could tell. Bottom line, he didn't have to agree to come on this virgin show of mine. A new show that has zero, and I mean zero, episodes out there at the moment. Without a doubt, that was an extremely kind and noble thing to do, Jared. I only hoped I was the best interviewer I could be. I thought Jared's narrative on the show was superb and captivating in his content as well as his delivery. And remember his book, It's Not Aliens, Worse, It's Us. Discovering Our Lost History is definitely worth checking out along with his excellent website at notaliens.com. Lots of information and stunning pictures that will make you wonder, what? You can also catch Jared co-hosting on Mike's excellent podcast, Conflict Radio. I can completely recommend listening to that show. Great guests, well presented. More importantly, it's always very interesting. And so, my friends, it's time for me to go. You can check out the show notes for this episode on our Facebook page or contact me directly via email the slick podcast at gmail.com like and share and leave a comment but please keep them kind i sincerely thank you for your time today and for also giving my first ever show a chance i greatly appreciate that and until we meet again take care be happy and stay safe bye slick podcast Keeping it real and always keeping it groovy.